C-SPAN. Next, a hearing on the status of the Defense Department's Joint Strike Fighter Program. Wednesday, a House Government Reform Subcommittee heard from Defense Department and General Accounting Office officials and others. The GAO recently conducted a review of the affordability of the program, which would allow three U.S. military services to build aircraft which would share common components. Connecticut Congressman Christopher Shays chaired the three-and-a-half-hour hearing. I'd like to call this hearing to order um, to welcome our witnesses and our guests and again to uh, invite anyone who wants to take off their coats. It's a hot room and uh, we've asked it to be cooled down but feel free to take off your jackets. The military procurement holiday is about to end. Defense budgets being debated today on both sides of the Capitol reflect a bicameral and bipartisan consensus on the need to modernize the aging planes, ships, weapons, and equipment used to win the Cold War. Today, we discuss the need to modernize the acquisition systems the Department of Defense DOD will use to procure post-Cold War weapon systems. Just as the weaponry of the last century won't win the peace in the next, the acquisition practices of the past will not e efficiently or affordably meet future defense needs. 15-year development cycles enshrine old technologies now rendered obsolete in 15 months. Massive cost overruns and schedule slippages are fueled in part by the launch of engineering and design work before hoped for technologies have been refined. Extraneous, often pervasive incentives push program officials towards artificial deadlines and premature production commitments. Various iterations of acquisition reform at DOD have attempted to address these problems and reinvigorate a hidebound acquisition culture inside and outside the Pentagon. In launching the 200 billion Joint Strike Fighter JSF aircraft acquisition, DOD promised the program would be a model of reform driven by affordability and the technical knowledge base, not by the disingenuous optimism and defense budget politics that proved so costly in the past. At the subcommittee's request, the General Accounting Office, GAO, analyzed the JSF acquisition strategy to determine if the promise of reform is being fulfilled in practice. Their report, released today, finds the Joint Strike Fighter program strained from commercial best practices and knowledge-driven benchmarks. As the date approaches to select a prime JSF contractor and begin engineering on the final system concept, DOD appears ready to abandon quantitative measures of technological maturity and revert to the business as usual of concurrent technology development and product development. GAO recommends DOD focus on risk reduction efforts by maturing critical technologies prior entering the next phase of the JSF program, even if that means delaying contra contractor, contractor selection and contract awards beyond the planned March 201 date, 2001 date. The program should be permitted to pursue the original low-risk acquisition strategy, according to GAO, without the penalty of withdrawal of funding support. DOD disagrees, claiming critical technologies will be matured enough to proceed in final design and engineering next year. As the debate unfolds, the choice should not be between a fully funded joint strike fighter and a commitment to acquisition reform. We can have both. If the program succumbs to Cold War acquisition habits, costs will skyrocket, the development cycle will stretch over the horizon, and the next generation fighter needed by the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marines might never fly. We welcome the testimony of all our witnesses on this important subject. And if I could, I'd like to welcome my colleague and ask if he has any comments to make. Thank you. No, I don't have any opening statement. I'll submit a, one uh, in a few days for the record. But I do want to compliment you on holding this hearing. Uh, when we look through the issues concerning the future of the military and the confidence that people have 
in our military, and as we make a renewed commitment as a Congress to our military, we've got to ensure that uh, the protocol is in place, the uh, system is in place to ensure that we use our money wisely, that we're looking towards the future. And uh, when I'm speaking at veterans organizations or just simply uh, people that are interested in my homes uh, of Omaha, Nebraska, and the home of Offutt Air Force Base, that's what they want to know. So that's why this hearing is so important today. And since it is so important, let me not continue to use the time. Let's hear from our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Terry. I have just uh, some housekeeping, if we could do that now. I ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose. Without objection, so ordered. I ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record without objection, so ordered. Our first panel, we have three, is Mr. Luis Rodriguez, Director, National Security and International Affairs Division, U.S. General Accounting Office, commonly referred to as GAO. In fact, I think that's, we refer to you more as GAO than the full title. Um, if now, Mr. Rodriguez, if you could um, stand up, we'll swear you in as we swear in all our witnesses. Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Note for the record, our witnesses has responded in the affirmative. Um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to run the clock for five minutes, then we will flip it again for another five, and then if you'd conclude within the ten-minute period. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Terry, I am pleased to be here today to discuss the application of best commercial practices to DOD weapon systems in general and to the Joint Strike Fighter in particular. Before getting into details, I'd like to emphasize the importance of the Joint Strike Fighter decision to reforming DOD's weapons acquisition process. As you know, the department is in the process of rewriting its directors gov directives governing systems acquisition, referred to as the DOD 5000 series. At the department's request, we have been participating in this efforts through input to its working group. The objective of the rewrite is to bring about better, cheaper, faster outcomes and weapons programs. It is acquisition reform. Our contributions or inputs to this effort are based on our reports for the Senate Armed Services Committee on using best commercial practices to improve weapons programs outcomes. The DOD draft rewrite embodies critical features documented in our work. Two of these features are critical to the upcoming Joint Strike Fighter decision First, that technology development must be separated from product development. That is, before entering engineering manufacturing development, we must have a match between proven technologies and requirements. And second, metrics to accurately, accurately measure technology must be used. In the 5000 series re rewrite, they are adopting a measurement system we use in our Joint Strike Fighter assessment, referred to as technology readiness levels. The commitment to this knowledge base versus the current schedule and funding driven process is reflected in the testimony of the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Reform on March 16th before the Government Reform Subcommittee on Government Management and IT, and I quote, in the new systems acquisition environment, key acquisition and long-term funding commitments will not be made until technology is mature. I have a lot of respect for the people in DOD who are leading acquisition reform. Philosophically, we are in agreement over best practices and the changes that are needed in the DOD environment to make such practices work on weapon systems. We at GAO are extremely encouraged by the commitment of DOD acquisition leaders to improving the weapons acquisition outcomes through the use of a knowledge-based commercial business practices. At the same time, however, we are concerned that the written directives and oral commitments will have little impact if not reflected in key decisions. In that sense, the key acquisition decision of entering engineering and manufacturing development on the Joint Strike Fighter stands out as the flagship for weapons acquisition reform. To apply anything less than the standards and the directives will send a clear message that while the instructions and rhetoric are changing, it's business as usual. I'll now briefly describe what we've learned from our best practices work and how we've applied that to assessing the Joint Strike Fighter program. Our best practices work has shown that knowledge-based process is essential to getting better cost schedule and performance outcomes. This means that decision makers must have virtual certainty about critical facets of the product under development when needed. 
This knowledge can be measured in three junctures that we refer to as knowledge points as shown in the chart to my right. Knowledge point one is when a match is made between the customer's requirements and the available technology. This occurs prior to entering product development. Knowledge point two is when the product's design is determined to be capable of meeting performance requirements. This occur occurs about midway through the product development phase. And knowledge point three is when the product is determined to be producible within cost schedule and quality targets, which occurs prior to entering production. Today I'll focus on only, on only knowledge point one because it is the biggest contributor to a successful product development. Achieving subsequent knowledge points depends on it and it is the point where JSF should be as it enters EMD. As the technology is developed, it moves from a concept to a feasible invention to a component that must fit onto a product and function as expected. In between, there are increasing levels of demonstration that can be measured. In our review of best practices for including new technology and products, we applied a scale of technology readiness levels from one to nine, pioneered by NASA and adapted by the Air Force Research Laboratory. Without going into the details of each level, a level four equates to a laboratory demonstration of a technology that is not in a usable form. Imagine an advanced radio technology that can be demonstrated with components that take up a tabletop. When initial hand-built versions of all the radio's basic elements are hand-wired and tested together in a laboratory, the radio reaches readiness level of five. A technology readiness level of seven is the demonstration of a technology that approximates its form, final form and occurs in an environment outside the laboratory. That same radio at level seven would be installed and demonstrated in a platform such as an existing fighter aircraft. The lower the level of the technology at the time it is included in product development, the higher the risk that it will cause problems in product development. According to the Air Force Research Laboratory, level seven enables a technology to be included on a product development with acceptable risk. When we asked leading commercial firms to apply these standards to their own methods of assessing technology maturity, we found that most insisted on even higher levels of readiness before they allowed a new technology into product development. Regarding the Joint Strike Fighter, in conjunction with the program office and the two competing contractors, we determined the readiness levels of critical technologies. The table to my right shows the technology readiness levels of eight critical technology areas identified by the Joint Strike Fighter program office. Uh, let me try to explain this a little bit. What we did is we had them score the technologies at three points. The blue line reflects where they were at program launch, the readiness level for each of those technology areas. The yellow line reflects where they were at the time that they did the scoring. And the red extend, uh, extension reflects where they plan to be based on what they're planning to do between now and the down select to the engineering manufacturing development phase. So it's the totality of the line that shows where they plan to be at EMD. In terms of engineering manufacturing development, which is reflected by the second diamond on the right, uh, none of the critical technology areas are projected to be at readiness level seven, which the Air Force Research Laboratory considers acceptable for entry into engineering manufacturing development. Should any of these technologies be delayed, or worse still, not available for incorporation into the final JSF design, the impact on the program would be dramatic. For example, if one of the critical technologies needed to be replaced with its planned backup, DOD could expect an increase of about 10% in unit costs. The backup technology would also significantly increase aircraft weight, which can negatively impact aircraft performance. This technology is projected to be at, at, at a technology readiness level of five at the beginning of the engineering manufacturing development phase, substantially below the, the criteria of seven. As noted earlier, at the policy level, DOD officials have agreed that technology development should be kept separate from product development and that technology readiness levels are a valid way to assess technology maturity. However, in response to our report on the Joint Strike Fighter, DOD balked at the use of technology readiness levels and their implications for keeping technology development out of the fighter's engineering and manufacturing development phase. One of the reasons DOD cited for its unwillingness to accept the technology readiness levels assessed was that the levels were based on integration of the, on, in the Joint Strike Fighter aircraft. On the contrary, 
The technology readiness levels assessed by the program office and the contractors were based on a clear understanding that a level 7 could be reached by demonstrating a technology in a relevant environment. It was further made clear that a relevant environment would include demonstrating a technology in an existing aircraft like an F-16, not a Joint Strike Fighter. There is no misunderstanding. A second reason DOD disagreed with the readiness levels assessed was that its own risk mitigation plans and judgment were more meaningful and they showed that the technology risk to be acceptable. Risk mitigation plans and judgment are necessary to managing any major development effort. However, without an underpinning such as technology readiness levels that allows transparency into program decisions, these methods allow significant technical unknowns to be judged acceptable risks because a plan exists for resolving them in the future. Experience, experience on previous programs has shown that such methods have rarely assessed technical unknowns as a high or unacceptable risk. Consequently, they fail to guide programs to meet promised outcomes. Technology readiness levels are based on demonstrations of how well technologies actually perform. Their strength lies in the fact that they characterize knowledge that exists rather than plans to gain knowledge in the future. In conclusion, we believe that separating technology development from product development can create conditions for a successful Joint Strike Fighter program. To proceed as planned, entering the engineering manufacturing development, development phase of the program with immature technologies is to risk schedule delays and cost growth. Instead, the program has an opportunity to mature technologies in a most, more risk-tolerant environment by making the right decisions now. In our report, we recommend that the Joint Strike Fighter Program continue in its current program definition and risk reduction phase, delaying the decision to move into engineering manufacturing until technologies are demonstrated to acceptable levels. Taking the additional time to mature the technologies will then allow the program manager to focus on design and manufacturing risks during engineering and manufacturing development. It also increases the possibility of completing product development in a more timely and predictable manner. Such a delay does not necessarily lengthen the total product development cycle. In fact, the knowledge gained from time spent developing technologies in the beginning can often shorten the time it takes to get the product. Similarly, a delay should not be misrepresented as a lessening of support for the Joint Strike Fighter program. Rather, it would demonstrate decision makers' willingness to make the upfront investment necessary to mature key technologies before committing the Joint Strike Fighter team to deliver a product. Such a commitment is more likely to put the program on a better footing to succeed than placing the burden on the engineering and manufacturing development phase. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you or the members may have. Thank the gentleman very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rodriguez. The bottom line is we're scheduled to um, build the Air Force F-22 and the F-A-18 EF Super Hornet, and then we're scheduled in the future to um, see the, uh, this project go forward. You're not um, suggesting in any way that we end this program and not do it, correct? Correct, Mr. Chairman. The bottom line to the debate we're going to have today is you just want them to follow their game plan. I want them to... And by they, the DOD, to follow their game plan. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, what we're talking about is the joint, joint Strike Fighter is, in fact, this decision is such a major decision, it is the signal of what happens in acquisition reform. It will underscore the implementation of the changes that are being made today in the regulations to guide this process. And if we make the same types of decisions that we've made in the past, that is to allow unknowns to creep into product development, to allow technology development to be done concurrently with product development, we'll continue to see long, very long development cycles like we have seen on the F-22, like we saw on the B-2, and like we've seen on programs historically. And that, that situation undermines our modernization effort, it leads to cost growth and schedule delays. It leads to the problems that we've seen with the programs in the past where we end up cutting the quantities in the half and never do meet our modernization goals. In fact, exacerbate the problem that we're trying to resolve, one of which is aging of the fleet. It is a real issue. 
and to continue to move into programs where we can't deliver on cost and schedule that are fit into very tight funding wedges puts us in a position where we end up in the future cutting the quantities because of cost problems and ending up without the modernization that we absolutely need. But bottom line, I just want to establish the point that GAO is not saying that we scrap this program. You want us to follow the game plan. And so now what this committee has to understand is what, what you're saying and what DOD is saying and where those uh, disagreements occur. I'm going to expose my ignorance a little bit here. If we could go to the first chart, I find that's the best way to learn. I sometimes make my staff nervous when I do this. It would, what this depicts, Mr. Chairman, is in effect a commercial model. Right. Now, what I need to do is just incorporate this with your uh, nine uh, um, product requirements. How does that, is this, this isn't the first three of the nine. Uh, can you incorporate this to um, the using te to TRLs? Okay. Uh, TRLs I I are a uh, metric. Right. They are a metric, and they, they're the metric that allows you to make the determination of the technology matched the requirements. So that the first knowledge point in any program is assuring that you have a match between the technology and the requirement. Is point three here, point seven on TRLs? No. Okay. The seven on the TRL is that that match has occurred. The technology to requirements match. It is the first knowledge point. Okay. It is where we are approaching on the joint strike fight. Right. And the debate, it seems to me, is uh, whether DOD th thinks your match point at seven is uh, the key point. They're willing to move forward before they've reached seven. Uh, to or me, do they do dispute that they haven't reached point at the point seven? Uh, I'm, I'm sure that'll become a confusing issue. When I just want to know what you think. And then oh, well, I, uh, to me, it's absolutely clear. Technology readiness levels put those technology, applying technology readiness levels, which is the demonstration of right. these technologies, puts those technologies where they are on the second chart. Would you put that chart back up, please? And, and we're accepting their projections of where they're going to be. Now, once again, as I said, the diamond to the right is where you should have to be. That is the level seven. It's the acceptable risk for entry into engineering, manufacturing, development. Right. And what I'm asking you is, do they dispute what you have up here, and are they think believe that the acceptable risk is at 0.6, and you believe the acceptable risk is at 0.7? What, where is the dispute as far as you would articulate it? Uh, I, they argued that there was a misunderstanding in the application because the, th these were applied by the contractors. We did not score these. Okay. The contractors applied the criteria. The DOD argument, as I understand it, is that there was a misunderstanding in the application. The, to get to a level seven requires the demonstration of the technology or the hardware involved in this technology at, uh, in the form, fit, and function. In other words, what it's going to really look like when it has to go on to the joint freight fighter in a relevant environment. And uh, the department's position, as I understand it, is that there was a misunderstanding and that uh, what people were thinking when they scored this was that we were saying it had to actually be on the joint strike fighter. Well, that obviously cannot happen before the program enters engineering, manufacturing, development, because there is no joint strike fighter. We worked very closely with the contractors and program office people were at those meetings to explain exactly how to do this. I have the sheets that were provided to them. We spent days, and we made sure that they understood that what we were talking about were surrogates. There is physically no way to do the kind of demonstration they're contending these people were thinking we were talking about absent a joint strike fighter. What we were talking about was demonstrated on surrogates. Okay, to give some life to these technologies, you, you've listed them under um, numbers because of proprietary issues. Yes. But, so I won't debate which is which, but what we're talking about is propulsion. Uh, we're talking about flight systems. We're talking about weapons. Each of these is a technology. We're talking about structures and materials. We're, in avi uh, avionics, we're talking about radar and the mission systems and supportability and training and producibility. Those are the things that we're talking about. Now, when we started out, they were at level, technology one, whichever one of those it is, was at level three. Uh, and 
uh, you're then saying uh, that they have gotten to level five uh, and expect to get in technology one to level six and then make a commitment. They're willing to commit at level six, correct? Uh, that's what we're saying. They, they're not going to agree with that, I don't okay, think. Okay, but that's fine. But right. that's what you think they're saying. And, um, and they're willing to commit on technology eight at level six. You're not saying they're willing to commit on technology four at level five, are you or are you? They're willing to right now, our understanding okay. is they plan to move ahead with in the every agenda. one of the levels that I mentioned. Unless they can trade, unless they trade these off, but right now they're in the program. These crit these are critical path technologies. Right. They, these things are essential, not technology one necessarily, and I want technology areas two through seven are critical to meeting the affordability goal. Right. And if affordability is the primary factor driving this program, which is my understanding of what everybody signed it up to, an affordable next generation aircraft, then being able to launch or, or have a program without these become really problematic. And the one example I used of one of these areas, if it were excluded or you had to go to its fallback, adding almost 10% to the uh, fixed wing version, which represents 1,700 plus of the aircraft they're gonna build, is a significant cost difference, and that's only one area. So these all deal with affordability. Well, there as long was as affordability remains paramount, the question becomes, if you don't use these, what does it do to your cost projections? If you go to a block approach, which, which they're talking about using an iterative process, going with a, a block one that doesn't have everything and moving on, I think we have to understand what are the implications of that, because what, then what you're doing then this is, is the launching first. into the development of a product and the production of a product that I'm not sure it even comes close to meeting cost goals because I don't know what the effect of deleting these off the first blocks are. And once you have that line started, if you're betting on technology in some subsequent block, in order to get the affordability into the program that you need in the long run, I don't think that we've solved anything by going okay. with block approach. I would agree with that. Let me just go back to your first chart again on the best practices model. And there are three knowledge points. In and I appreciate the indulgence of the committee just to go a little further on this. Knowledge one, um, the, the, this is basically um, the characteristic of best practices act for any industry uh, in this modern day and age. It's the best commercial right. practice. And the concept is matches made between the customer's requirements and the available technology. Yes. So whatever technology is available, how can we meet the customer's requirements? And we try to match those two. And then the second point is when the product's design is determined to be capable of meeting performance requirements. Yes, and, that, and there's a metric associated with that as well. But that, the, the Joint Strike Fighter right now would be in the equivalent of what's called a technology development phase up there. It is in risk reduction, a, a concept demonstration, right. it's a combined phase. But so it's really before that point of technology match. That's we're, we're, we're not at point two yet. No, that'll be, the, the product development is the equivalent of the engineering manufacturing development phase. Knowledge point two is a standard knowledge point that occurs both in industry and in the department. The department just doesn't adhere to it. They actually have the standard and they have the metrics for measuring it. Okay, and, and then that is that it's, it's uh, something called uh, CDR, uh, critical design review, and the standard is that 90% of the drawings are released to manufacturing at that point. Now, unfortunately, the department doesn't adhere to that. The standard exists. They don't. In commercial industry, the ones that, the, when we were doing the best commercial practices going out there, they exceed the 90%. Yeah, line I have two basic more questions, though. When we get to knowledge point three, the product is determined to be producible within cost, schedule, and quality targets. Now, um, is, is the desire on the part of the military to move forward, in your judgment, uh, with production before we have reached point two, is that because they want the product to do more than right now the technology allows? Uh, well, let me try to clarify something. This isn't about moving forward at this point with production. Right. This is about entry into product development. Right. And uh, 
I don't know what but, the but, position is. But was. even that, the point, the question still stands, and, and thank you for clarifying it. The bottom line, though, is I'm just trying to understand the tension. Sure. In other words, they want, this, they want this airplane to do more than the technology presently allows, correct? Uh, using technology readiness levels, that's an absolutely true f right. statement. So the issue is if they, if they had to accept the technology that existed today, they wouldn't be able to have this plane do what they want it to do. So that's the tension. But they want the project to keep moving forward. Yes. The message that I'm hearing from GAO is saying, relax. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're at the cutting edge. We're not talking about the Cold War, where we have to rush this to the marketplace. Absolutely. And so we need to slow down, develop the technology, before we start to do the development. Yes. And, and the, the other thing they're trying to get across in here is that when we make those decisions to accept these unproven technologies into a product development, and maybe I need to explain product development better, product development is the engineering manufacturing development phase in this context. In the engineering manufacturing development phase, we should be focusing on developing and manufacturing the final product. In this case, it's the full-up plane with everything on it. What we do, or what we have done historically in the Department of Defense, is we go into that phase, which is difficult in and of itself if you're using all proven technologies. To integrate a bunch of new technologies into a final product is still not an easy process. What we do is we allow immature technologies that are pacing items. These are defined, the ones we had up there, critical technology areas. Critical means they're on critical path to success. We allow that immature technology, unproven technology, to enter into the product development phase. What you end up with then are long development cycles, because now you have to bring those technologies along. You have people having to focus on technology development when we should be focusing on engineering and manufacturing development of a product, not the sub-technologies that go into it. As I said, that's a challenge by itself. In okay. industry, they create a job that's doable by a program manager. His job is to bring proven technologies together into a form that gives you the product that meets the customer's requirements. We expect our program managers to manage technology development and product development concurrently. And, tech, and, product de and technology development is invention. Invention cannot be scheduled. And we set up tight schedules where these things have to fit in those schedules. The money's all lined up. Money becomes the driver. Schedule becomes the driver. And what we've actually accomplished tends to fall by the wayside. Let me um, uh, recognize Mr. Blavojevich, the ranking member. I, I didn't. Uh, if you have an opening statement you want to make, I'm happy to have you do it, or if we can get right in the question. But uh, he's your witness, and you have him for as long as you need him. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just uh, dispense with the opening statement and uh, ask a couple of questions of Mr. Rodriguez. Mr. Rodriguez, the chairman briefly mentioned that uh, if we slow down the, uh, the uh, effort to get into the engineering and manufacturing phase, um, that's essentially the gist of what your argument is. That does not necessarily slow down, slow down the entire program. Uh, and it's conceivable, does it not, that if we slow down in the technological development phase, that in the long run, the time saved early on to get it right, could actually shorten the process? Is that, can you speak to that? The, the, that's, that's exactly the fundamentals behind everything in the, in the practices that we're laying out from the work that we've done on best commercial practices. That putting the time in to get the technology match up front makes the product development cycle doable. Instead of having programs that extend for 10 and 12 years that are absolutely unmanageable. If I could share with you, would you put up the chart <coughs> on the 10 years? This is what happens to you as programs stretch and grow, and this is DOD data. Now, I would contend that it's very optimistic, but what their data shows is that, on average, you'd have 11-year program cycle. In 11 years, you go through four program managers, five program executive officers, eight service execu acquisition executives, eight defense acquisition executives, five chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, seven secretaries of defense, three presidents, and 11 cycles of coming up here to get money and going through the department to get money. And we wonder why programs perturbate and drag on and take forever. One of the problems you have is our cycle times become so long in the product development because we're doing technology development and you should expect problems. And we see them. I mean, this body approved entry into production on the F-22 with a single flight hour. 
And we expect that to stay on schedule, and we expect that to stay on cost. We knew virtually nothing about the capability of that plane in terms of demonstration. And what we have are a lot of hopes pinned on judgment about our ability to deliver those things. Judgment is not good enough in a best commercial practice. Demonstration is what counts. And if you don't demonstrate it, you end up with 12-year cycles. And you end up with these problems. And you end up with absolutely no accountability. We have to match cycle time to program managers' tenures to be able to hold people accountable, give them a job that's doable, which is product development when we're in product development. And the only way you can do that is separating technology development from product development. And the only way you can legitimately do that is through a metric that allows you to absolutely measure demonstration. Mm. I looked at that chart, three presidents, seven secretaries of defense, four program managers. The only ones who last 11 years are generally members of Congress, short uh, of term limits. And unfortunately, me. Yeah, and you. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about the importance of the continuity of keeping a program manager uh, involved in, in a program like this, uh, how sure. it works in the commercial sector and how successful that is to have that mm -hmm. continuity? You know, clearly, you know, as I looked at these and you try to figure out, well, what could you control here? The only one you could really control is, and that would really have a direct effect is program manager, because uh, program executive officers, and goes, they have a whole portfolio. Uh, some of the others are political appointees, and you can't control that. But the program manager tenure can be controlled. And uh, if you don't have that, what you have is a situation we're in now. The Joint Strike Fighter is on its third program manager. It's only been around for three and a half years. It's on its third. The third one is there now. His job is to deliver this program into engineering manufacturing development as scheduled. The money is there. They're ready to go. Everything's lined up. It's in all their out year budgets. Uh, you can talk about wonderful plans for modernization and the need to be able to get a new plane. And I agree with that. We need to get new planes out there. My problem is the way we're going to do this one is it won't get there in time, it won't get there in quantity, and we won't reach modernization. This isn't what's going to get you there. In terms of matching that program manager's tenure, and it, it, it is what gives you accountability. You, we have to give these people doable jobs, put them in there for the tenure of the program to deliver the product so we can get focus on product. Our focus now is on the next increment of funding, the next milestone, how can people stay focused on delivery of a product that's 12 years away? Mm -hmm. uh, I can't think of anybody. I, to tell you the truth, I've been doing this for leading this work for over 12 years. I could not have focused 12 years ago on where I am today. There's no way. And if you told me this is what I had to do, I would have told you you were crazy. It just doesn't happen. You focus in shorter increments. People don't think that way. Industry has gone basically from an 18-month to a four-and-a-half-month cycle. And, and the reason for that is to get that focus on product, give people doable jobs, get the stuff out there quickly because stuff turns over fastly in terms of technologies, and rather than have these huge cycle times that lead to obsolescence. I mean, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars right now on the F-22 to buy out parts that are obs already obsolete and we haven't even built the plane. So that's, when you're looking at 12 to 15 year cycle times, that's what's going to happen to you. We have to shorten that. And I would submit, and we have, uh, we did a hearing uh, before the Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, Subcommittee on Readiness and Management on developing a model that would deal with these issues. One of the things that you have to do is you have to put a strict limit on the engineering manufacturing development or the product <coughs> development phase. In five years, I think uh, Dr. Gansler has set 67 months at this point is their goal. Five years is a doable thing. It allows you to match tenure. It brings accountability. It brings focus to the process. And it forces you to do trades on the front end. If you have a limit that you're going to be held accountable to, then you will have to do the trades of the technology and cost on the front end that allows you to do a deliverable product in a five-year cycle. Okay. One final question, Mr. Rodriguez. We like the Joint Strike Fighter, you and I. Absolutely. You certainly have said you do. I certainly think it's a good idea. And we're for this. We want to see this get done sooner rather than later. That's good for our military, good for our national defense. We agree with that, right? right. What do you say to the argument that if we, if we adopt what you're recommending as opposed to what the Department of Defense is recommending, this can hamper the ability to keep the support here in the Congress to be able to fund this program? I, I, unfortunately, I think that's a real risk. I mean, it requires an understanding on the part of the members. 
The fact of the matter is, if we launch with immature technologies, you will not get this program in the, on the schedule or on the cost. We will end up with the problems that we have had historically by going into product development with immature technology. You cannot schedule invention. It will create problems. And if they're critical path items, they become the pacing item. And the cost of that is phenomenal. Let me give you an idea of this. Right now, in the Joint Strike Fighter, if you were to annualize numbers and take a look at it on a single contractor, because that's where we're going to go in EMD, down to one contractor. Right now, in the risk reduction phase, we're spending the equivalent of about $265 million a year to do risk reduction. That includes the demo and all the other risk reduction activities on these critical technologies. To fail at $265 million a year on something is kind of okay. When we go into EMD, our cost for a single contractor immediately jumps to an annualized rate of $1.2 billion, and within two years of that, we'll be at $4 billion a year. Now, you have a problem with a critical path technology at that point, you are carrying a $4 billion program on your back, not $265 million where you can tolerate some problems in invention. And, and you know, the basic cost trade-offs are for every dollar mistake I make in risk reduction phases or technology development, if I do that in, in the engineering manufacturing, it's going to cost me 10. And if I do that same pro have that same problem, which the department does, we're in producing F-22s now and have not completed the development phase, when you run into problems there, now that $1 now costs you 100 So, I mean, this, this has to do with bringing affordability and discipline to the process to get what we need, which is a modernized fleet. Okay. And uh, I, I just don't see where following the practices of the past are going to get us to where we need to be. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Terry. It, it, this is a very interesting discussion. Uh, before I ask a couple of my, my questions, I'll say that I took a tour here a couple of weeks ago of a, a company in my hometown that's one of the leading uh, high-tech support for our private sector industries across the nation. I mean, and they made a comment during the presentation when I was being wowed by their technology. He said, you know, our clients expect us to be cutting edge, but not bleeding edge. <laughs> and as I've listened to your testimony or, uh, and thoughts about immature technology, that's really what we're talking about, is getting ahead of ourselves in the technology and perhaps slowing down. I've got several questions. Uh, but I'll, I'll narrow it down to a couple here. And one is just so I can put it in kind of a congressional or simple terms. Uh, I see a catch-22 here where we in Congress expect out of our Department of Defense, and I think um, the people of this country expect, if anyone's going to be on the bleeding edge or that's acceptable, it would be our Department of Defense. They want that type of technology in there. Now, assuming that they have those type of political pressures, how do they develop a more acceptable, best commercial practice timeline? It seems to me that they never can. How do we do that? Right. Taking in the uh, desire to, to assure the public that we're using best commercial practices, but then also accepting the role that we want them to be on the far beyond cutting edge to maybe the bleeding edge of technology that's always moving. Right. I, uh, I don't see a disparity between these two things. What we're talking right. about is product and how you go about getting product and how you get product better and how you get to, it's really about how do you get those technologies, those more advanced technologies to the field faster. Do you do it through a more iterative process or do you do it through go for everything that's out there 20, you know, it takes us 20 years to get there and then by the time you get there it's all, you can't support it, it's obsolete, you got to buy out stuff because nobody builds this anymore. Uh, it, it really is about getting down to the basics of changing the culture and the incentives. But the other part of it is, and you can be on the bleeding edge, but be on it in technology development. Go chase those technologies. <laughs> you need parameters around which you're going to invest in that and, and how you're going to manage that technology base and how you're going to graduate that technology to a product and when's the right time to bring it into a product. 
I'm not saying don't chase technologies. I'm saying don't chase it as part of a product development. It, it has cost you way too much money. And hence, then, you're doing your job in showing us uh, or, or talking about the best commercial practices and how to institute that in the system. But then how do we justify as congressmen or the president or Department of Defense, you know, all right, we're, we identify what we need in this plane, let's manufacture it today in our Joint Strike Fighter Force. Mm -hmm. Then the technology changes two or four years after production that makes it obsolete and we end up spending more money in a production of the next generation sooner than we probably should have. How do we justify that? I guess I don't. I'm kind of asking you a political yeah, question. That's yeah. not your realm here. I, I think the department is moving to, and, I, and, and probably Mr. Solowy will talk about it. Is the problem with the rapid changes in technology? It's a reality. You, you, you can't change that. People have to recognize that that's the situation, and that what we really need to do is go to a more iterative process in how we build things. In other words, we don't decide today on a firm design that we're going to build for 20 years. I mean, that isn't how the world works. And in fact, that isn't how we really build planes. If you would look at an F-16, we built the A's and B's and Block 10 and Block 20, Block 30, Block 40, Block 50. Now we're at Block 60. Now we're going to get ready to build Block 60I for somebody else. I mean, th in reality, that's what you end up doing. Things change, and you make those changes in the subsystems. But that basic design that you commit to has to last longer than just a few planes so you can get your money back out of it. So th there are ways to do this. I, you see, to me, it mostly rests with the department. It's what they come up here and sell. Unfortunately, we have a system now that, that incentivizes everybody to come up here and promise you the world and promise you all these wonderful things and lay out way early in a process an exact commitment to schedules and costs, build all that funding in. And you know where they're doing that? They're doing that before they even get into that technology development phase. They don't have the slightest idea whether those things are going to work or what they're going to cost. But we lock in to a commitment early on. And what we're, one of the things that needs to be done is to delay the commitment until you have the technology match. We shouldn't allow people, and they shouldn't be encouraging, selling product on a technology that's absolutely unproven. I mean, it, you're raising everyone's expectations to levels that are going to do well, and, failure. And, and during your presentation when you were talking about that and answering the chairman's questions, I wrote a note down as, what responsibility does Congress have? Because I think we encourage that. So maybe we should be a, we should ask you to do a GAO report on what type of uh, congressional or political reforms we need in house, so we don't encourage that type. But we're, uh, we're, uh, I agree that in, in trying to apply business-like procedures, we don't encourage them from our side to do it either. Mm -hmm. And we have so, done uh, some pieces on this whole issue of what incentivizes the culture and the process at DOD, and, and Congress is a big player in that. Well, uh, before we run and vote, let me ask just one, one simple question of you. In your testimony, you had mentioned the uh, kind of use uh, kind of colloquial language here, but they said they're, they're talking about adopting the best commercial practices. They're talking the talk, but they aren't walking it yet. How do we ensure that they are uh, implementing these type of uh, best commercial practices uh, at the highest level instead of just talking about it? I think you have to do it program by program, and the Joint Strike Fighter is the lead program, and it is the one to do it on. And in the report, I uh, believe that uh, you're going to release here at the hearing, we have a matters for consideration. And those matters considerations spell out what we think you should require the Secretary of Defense to lay out for you. And we need a metric that is understandable. Let me talk about technology readiness levels for us. They're actually very simple. I think that's why people don't like them, because you'll actually be able to understand them. They, and, and to simply say what they are, there are nine levels. What we're talking about is progressing to the level of seven for entry into product development or engineering manufacturing development. The first three levels are basically paper studies. Now, I don't know how many people want to launch a whole big aircraft program based on a paper study, but I'm not too fond, a uh, paper study of a new technology. Uh, I, I went, uh, not a good idea. The next two levels, four and five, are basically laboratory hardware demonstrated in a laboratory environment. These are pretty easy things. This is, 
I don't know if you know how many labs you've been out to, but you'll see, I've been to laser labs, and you walk in there, I was very disappointed. I thought I was going to see a laser. What I see is these parts spread all over tables. They're hand-wired, so that way they can change the resistors. You know, they can do the stuff you have to do in a lab. And it's only in that lab environment. It's not going to be flying on a plane like we want it to or in a space air aircraft. Or and then le to get to level six and seven, you actually have to get it down, that big thing that's spread in a lab, down to the form and the fit that it's going to have to be in in the intended product. And you have to actually have taken it out into the environment you're going to use it in. That doesn't mean you put it on the plane it's going to be on because the plane doesn't exist. That means you put it on a plane if it's something that has to fly and you actually fly it. So now you have the form and fit that you're going to need for the product. You put it into the environment. We're not talking about operational testing. We're saying understand the environment. That's level six and seven. These things are understandable. Mm -hmm. They are things that you can measure fairly ready, read, readily. They are not subject to engineering judgment or consensus, which is what we've t tended to use or what we have used in the past it gets us into so much trouble and they are things that you as a board of directors need to begin to understand and to focus on and to hold the joint strike fighter to. And, and what is the time those. frame the, for the pro product development time frame? Well right now they're planning on going into... That you would recommend or oh, is that I would recommend. I would recommend that we limit it to five years so we can bring accountability to process. It, it would be hard with an eight or ten year cycle to say, well, we're going to put a program manager in there and we expect them to stay there for ten years. I mean, life just doesn't happen that way. Thank uh, you. I, uh, I'm sorry. We're going to have to keep here. We'll have just a few more questions afterwards. We have to vote and we stand at recess. We'll try to be back in ten minutes. Uh, the hearing is uh, reopened. I'm curious, that took me 15 minutes? So next time I'll say 15, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I want to just establish some basic points, and I'm not looking for, for long answers. Uh, one of the points I want to establish is to understand what I think I understand, but to just have you describe it. In, um, it's not an uncommon practice for... Um, a building to be built before it's been fully designed. And the argument is you can build it faster and you can save yourself from increased costs, the inflation rate and so on. I make the assumption that when you're building a building and you haven't designed it, you still have all the technology there. So that kind of argument isn't compatible where you kind of build before you've totally designed. Here, um, we're trying to make sure that we know that t technology exists uh, obviously before uh, production, but even before development. Is that correct? Yes, before, before product development, yes. Right. And um, what I want to understand as well is that with, um, with the F-22, that basically is a new airplane. We're not following uh, this practice that we're, we're following with um, joint, joint strike fighter. The F-18, which we are, uh, which is the uh, E and F, is a modification, a larger uh, F-18, but a modification of existing technology. Uh, it's not a new plane, correct? Uh, there's very little commonality between the F-18CD and the F-18EF. The, the, the department sold that as an upgraded okay. F-18, but well, it, there's, they sold nothing, me on it. there's nothing the same about it. So I didn't it, get really. the answer I expected. Yeah. Uh, but basically, you consider it a pretty new plane. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're building the V-22, but we made a decision that we would not build the AFX, or the AX, um, which was uh, to replace the A-12 Navy attack plane. 
we drop the multi-role fighter. And so we are um, now going to be developing um, the, the JFS. And uh, it is going to have to, um, the JSF is going to have to fulfill a lot of very different roles. It's going to be used by the Air Force uh, in conventional takeoff and landing. It's going to be used by the Navy for shaped, shorter takeoffs on carriers. And my understanding is it has to be a, a tougher plane, and it's going to weigh a little more. Uh, and then we are going to be using it for the Marine Corps and the, and the uh, UK Royal Navy as a vertical takeoff, uh, like the Harrier jet. Um, and yet it's all coming from one program, so there are a lot of technologies that are uh, in play here. Uh, your bottom line point is that um, we should not develop and produce this plane until we follow the game plan, which is to make sure the technology exists, and that we use best commercial practices. The first com question that I want to ask in regards to best commercial practices, what best practices would not be appropriate in the DOD acquisition process? Uh, I, can you think of any? No, I can't think of any at all. I mean, and really what it, what it then comes down to, and I think it was, it was something that uh, came out in earlier questions, it really comes down to how do you incentivize the process to put these things in place? You know, what, what do we do to make it so that uh, bringing knowledge to the table rather than judgment uh, to, to really be focused on setting a product development up for absolute success. How do you create the incentives to do that, to not oversell, to not overpromise, to not overcommit, okay. but sure. to do what technology allows? And how much cheaper is it to wait now to develop the technology than to begin to develop or produce uh, this plane without the technology? As I said, the, the rules of thumb are if you uh, run into problems when you're in technology development, a dollar problem there becomes a $10 problem when you enter into product development. And if you actually get all the way to, to uh, manufacturing or production and you're still doing technology and you're having problems, that same dollar problem now becomes a $100 problem. So, so a 10 to 1 ratio and then a 100 to 1 ratio. Right, order of magnitude increases, yes. And, and some estimates are much higher than that. Commercial industry, where you're doing huge runs of production items, where you'd have to do recalls, those numbers increase dramatically. Now, uh, to the best of your knowledge, you're speculating, what would motivate, in your judgment, the military, the DOD, to move forward? Uh, and if, I always believe there are logical reasons why they want to move okay. forward. Are they, it, it, do you think it's the, the, the potential that they think Congress might withdraw if they're not heavily committed, um, and therefore they'd rather get the plane this way even if it costs more and they get less planes? Because it's going to cost more, they're going to get less planes. Right. Um, uh, or is there another reason that I'm not thinking? No, I think it is, it, that is it. It is the incentives. The money is in place. It's very difficult to get money and wedges and approval and get something going. And if you came in now, I mean, there's a picture of a program manager that comes in now. His job at this point in time on something like a Joint Strike Fighter, his job, the task that he has, is to get this program into engineering, manufacturing, development on schedule. The yeah. money is all lined up. Uh, in fact, the, the current program manager leaves as soon as the down select's made and the process is handed over to somebody else who's going to have to worry about this. But let's imagine that that uh, he takes a look at it and he says, well, wait a second, you know, some of these technologies, uh, we really don't know all that much about it. So what I want to do is propose a delay. Well, now he has to go through the process in the Department of Defense where there are all kinds of people competing for these limited dollars, waiting to find a place where they can take it from. And the Department does it itself all the time. Well, you know, I... And it comes up here to the Congress, and there are a lot of people looking to fund other things, and there's only so much money to go around. Well, I, that risk is absolutely real. Well, and it's a real risk, but it's even more a risk if the F-22 and the F-A-18 E and F are, are going to uh, 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 be much more costly than we anticipated because they're not following these kinds of practices. So, in a sense, the, the, the Joint uh, Strike Fighter is going to mm -hmm. be... Um, 
is going to be following uh, a process that should save money in the long run, or certainly not add to costs, competing with uh, two other weapon systems that may gobble up costs. Right. So I have sympathy for that, if that's it. Um, then I'll just ask this last question. What is magical about a date? Uh, these time, I mean, what, is there, you had, haven't developed any, um, any logic that says that uh, a Cold War enemy or a non-Cold War enemy is going to be able to beat us and, and, and supersede us. So that from that standpoint, we don't have a rush, correct? Right. This is a, the objective was to get an affordable family of next generation aircraft, and the key was affordability. And we do well, have, it, it's and we... Not basically threat-driven at this point. Okay, and I'm going to just state it, and then it can be refuted by DOD. Uh, but the bottom line is one of the potential luxuries of the Cold War ending, I consider the world a more dangerous place, but for other reasons, but the Cold War has ended, we have some ability to develop the technology, or a lot of ability to develop the technology before we go into uh, development and right. production. Absolutely, and, and the, but going back, if you don't have the technology match, the fact that there is an, an, some threat out there that you need to deal with, that, that doesn't justify the mismatch of technology because you're going to run into problems when you try to build that thing, and it is going to take you longer and longer and cost you more and more. So even if the Cold War hadn't ended, you would be arguing the same thing? Even if I would be arguing for some constraint in what you do as you move forward. There are ways to deal with that. You can do... Uh, there are still today, there are some things where we don't have capability and I can't talk about those, uh, where there are real threats out there that we can't deal with, particularly electronics, uh, where we could go ahead with a very limited scale of something to get some kind of capability, even though we know it won't meet the whole thing, it gives us something in the short run to be able to deal with part of the problem. Th there are cases where you could make a case for why you'd want to take those risks. I don't see those in the Joint Strike okay. Fighter. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Biggert has joined us, and I'd uh, yield her the f not yield her, but give her the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have one question. I'm sorry I missed the testimony. But uh, yesterday, the uh, Senate Armed Forces uh, Committee deleted the en uh, engineering and preliminary manufacturing money, uh, but said that the Pentagon could uh, get the, the $424 million back if the plane proved it was ready to ne take the next step. Do you think that this will be a possibility? That, uh, that you mean that they'll take the next step? That, it, yes, that, that the... That uh, they'll be able to accomplish that, take the mm -hmm. next step within this year? Mm -hmm. uh, not, not really, no, I don't. Not based on where they are in technologies, provided those technologies remain untradeable from meeting the affordability goal. As long as those technologies are there, I don't believe you could get it done in a year. Uh, could they get lucky and do it? I suppose. I don't think they have the... Uh, demonstrations laid out at this point that would get them to the appropriate technology level to have that assurance. I, I, I just don't see how that would happen. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Terry. Okay. Um, is there any uh, uh, last, uh, is there a question we should have asked that you would have liked us to ask or a point <laughs> that you want to make? There, there is one point that I skipped. Yeah. Uh, uh, Actually, two things. One is, when we talked about these, uh, the differences as far as we're concerned in the scoring of the technologies and the department's position on that, uh, I, I do want to make you aware that we had a closed hearing and we went through those technologies. And could you put that back up again? I want to point one thing out. Sure. One of the basic arguments was that there was a misunderstanding, that when they scored the technologies, they thought we were saying in order for it to get to a level seven, the level needed to enter EMD, that it had to be on the Joint Strike Fighter aircraft. As I said, that would be an impossibility, obviously not the standard. We spent a great deal of, deal of time working with the people who apply this at the contractor plants and the program office to get this clear understanding that we were talking about demonstrating something in close form and fit on in the environment, not on the Joint Strike Fighter, on some kind of surrogate platform. But if you look at this, you can see a number of those technologies are, are projected at the point you know, where the red line ends, projected only to be at readiness level four. Uh, technology area seven, technology area three, and technology area two. As I said earlier, level four is not form and fit. It is laboratory 
hardware in a laboratory environment. So this argument about, oh, there was confusion about scoring this because we thought you meant you had to have it on a joint strike fighter, doesn't even come into play in the scoring of those technologies. And I am telling you, we made that absolutely clear, so there is no misunderstanding. The other thing is the question about what can Congress do or what should you do. I think we should require them to be held to a level seven of demonstration. And in those cases where they can or believe that they should move without that, they should have to provide a very discreet, first of all, that they score it properly and own up to the scoring. Let's not play games. These are pretty clear things to score. There is no confusion. And once we score it, if the scoring comes out less than a level seven, the only way they should be able to meet for is to first make it clear to you where they are on those critical technologies and then explain to you why it is that we need to take on that additional risk of moving forward without having demonstrated the technologies that are going to be critical to the building of that final product, to taking those technologies and having a very difficult task of trying to integrate a whole bunch of technologies into a final product. Uh, you, you wanted to make that point, but it does raise a question now. And the question it raises for me is, is this a package deal? Do, do all have to, to be there in order to go to that next step of, of development? Or, or, or do we isolate each one of these technologies as a separate issue uh, before we move forward? As long as they're on the critical path, the pacing item in any area whatever it is, is the long pole in the tent is what you have to oh, worry about. This is the about. question I'm asking. Is it, is it, are these, e are they uh, independent uh, or do I have to take, do, do I have to take them all as a package? No, they're independent. You, you do each one. Right. I, I anticipated that be right. the answer, but I just want to make sure. Uh, do you, are you at liberty to tell us which area we uh, have the, the, um, the greatest challenge right now? Um, is this a proprietary issue or not? I can't imagine it would be. Without identifying which is one and which is two and so on, can you tell us the area where we're doing the best and where we're potentially doing the worst? Well, I mean, clearly the best. Uh, well, uh, let me ask a question. Is that an uncomfortable question? Uh, we're boarding. Well, I can say okay. clearly from this, the best are the ones that would be technology area one, which I think you have a thing that tells you what that is. I can't. Yes. I, I okay, don't want to say fair that. enough. But clearly, one and eight. Okay. Uh, someone will have to explain to me, and I should have clarified before, but I'm not going to push the point why it even matters, why we can't have that dialogue. But, but fair enough. I guess because we haven't made a choice on who gets what. And and not enough. both fair contractors enough. don't work the same technologies. Fair enough. No, no, we, we can respect that. That that's fair. Um, You've been wonderful. Uh, you've, you. you've put the ball in play, and uh, you've given an opportunity for those who follow to answer your points. Uh, I don't know if you or someone else can stay to hear the other presentations, because we might uh, seek to have uh, your office respond, you preferably, but if not, someone else. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. We'll go to our second panel. Is that okay? Go to, uh, we'll go to panel two, and um, I thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Uh, we have Mr. Stan Soloway, uh, who is the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Acquisition Reform, Department of Defense, and Major General Raymond Hewitt, uh, U.S. Air Force Acquisition Program, uh, Department of Defense. And if you both uh, would stand, we'll swear you in. What I think I'm going to do is just slide you over a little bit so you both, uh, Mr. Soloway, if you can move your chair over just a little bit. Thank you. So we give Mr. Hewitt a little, General Hewitt, I'm sorry, General. That's great. If you'd raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Gentlemen, it's, it's uh, great to have you here, and I appreciate uh, your spending the time with us. And uh, I want to make sure that... Uh, uh, Mr. Soloway, we have you first. Am I breaking protocol or am I keeping protocol? That's right. <laughs> okay. <I'm in> charge. <laughs> I'm in charge. <laughs> That's protocol. That's protocol. Okay. Well, Mr. Soloway, we'll, we'll start with you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. And uh, if I could just divert for a moment from my prepared text and, and say that I do believe that there are uh, is extraordinary commonality between what the GAO is recommending and what we are looking at in terms of a strategy of how to uh, deal with the issues before us, and hopefully we'll have a robust discussion of that as, as we move forward. But I am pleased to be here to have this opportunity to discuss with you our continued progress with acquisition reform and particularly how it relates and applies to the Department's Joint Strike Fighter program. 
As you know, acquisition reform has been a top priority for the department for the last several years and encompasses a wide range of initiatives and has had many real successes. Let me list just a few. One excellent example is the Joint Direct Attack Munition, or JDAM, which performs so flawlessly in Kosovo. Designated as an acquisition pilot program, JDAM was originally expected to cost in excess of $40,000 per unit. But through a combination of acquisition reforms and focused innovative program management, we can now purchase JDAM for less than half that amount. That's the unmanned pr uh, plane. No, JDAM is a, uh, a, essentially a guidance kit is the best way to describe it. Is it? Probably the best way to say it, it's, it's a, uh, a strap-on kit okay. for our general purpose bombs that okay. gets it an all-weather right. all capability. It. Thank you. INS, International Navigation System with Global Position Assisting Guidance. Gotcha. No, you, I've seen it and I appreciate having it clarified. Thank you. Then there is the Precision Location GPS Receiver or Plugger. This receiver was purchased largely through the new commercial buying authorities contained in the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act replaces a previous field version built to extensive military specifications that weighed over 30 pounds, required two operators, had only one channel, and cost us thousands of dollars per unit. Plugger, on the other hand, requires only one operator, has five channels, weighs just over two pounds, and costs less than $1,000 a unit. The All Ordnance Destruct System, or AODS, is a flight termination system used on the rocket system launch program vehicles at the Space and Missile Systems Center. The majority of these vehicles are used as targets in support of the ballistic missile defense programs. By utilizing the commercial buying authorities known as FAR Part 12, unit costs were reduced from the previous purchase price of $900,000 a kit down to $55,000 a kit, but more importantly, the new kits are also technically superior. Today, circuit cards for the avionics and the F-22 are being produced largely on a commercial line at TRW, thus saving the department significant resources that would have had to be devoted to unique development and production facilities. Moreover, the reliability testing on those circuit cards have demonstrated excellent results, and costs appear to be significantly lower than expected, 55 percent to 70 percent less than their military standardized counterpart. Acquisition reform is also central to the development of the Navy's new Virginia-class attack submarine. Key to the success of the program has been the use of integrated product and process development teams, the use of open systems architecture, and the insertion of commercial off-the-shelf technologies. The Navy will benefit from a cost avoidance of $30 million per ship, but more importantly, the Virginia class will operate at a 32 percent lower total ownership cost than the comparable Seawolf. Indeed, much has changed and for the better. Given the complexity of our business practices and the entrenched cultures we have inside and outside of the government, I believe we have made substantial progress, but clearly we must do more. The security environment we face is unpredictable and unstable, and our success in meeting the challenges of the battlefield of the near and more distant future will hinge in large part on our ability to access and integrate true cutting edge technologies that provide us the dominance, speed, and scope of information that we need. One of the means for accomplishing these goals is through restructuring how we develop, manufacture, and maintain mm -hmm. our weapon systems. It is no secret that cycle times for new weapon systems from concept to fielding remain unacceptably high and that such long cycle times too often result in the fielding of already obsolete technologies. Since some technology decisions must be made early in a program, it is clear that our history of taking 15 or more years to field new systems is not at all consonant with the torrid pace of technology change we see today. There are, of course, many reasons for these long cycle times. Key among them is often the very nature of the requirements set forth for any individual program. Traditionally, our requirements have been both inflexible and involved extraordinary technology challenges that can take many years to meet. This is beginning to change. Today, both our operational and acquisition and technology communities recognize that to optimize support for our men and women in the field and to most responsibly steward the public's tax dollars, we need to institute new requirements and acquisition strategies. Indeed, we are confident we can indeed significantly reduce cycle times and costs and provide systems to the warfighter faster through a more flexible evolutionary approach. How we do this, how we develop, manufacture, and maintain systems is based in the department's 5,000 series documents, our Bible for systems acquisition, which we are currently rewriting. The DOD 5000 rewrite will drive the department further toward evolutionary acquisition and increase our focus on flexibility and requirements. Additionally, the new 5000 will require greater technical maturity prior to entering the manufacturing phase of a program. In the new systems acquisition environment, key acquisition decisions and long-term funding commitments may not be made until technology shows the required maturity and risks are better understood and mitigated than has traditionally been the case. 
and the JSF program is a forerunner of this new approach. Indeed, since its inception, the JSF program has been recognized for utilizing and actually pioneering many acquisition reform concepts and applying them to the actual business processes and contract vehicles being utilized, including but not limited to the critical precepts of the new 5000 series. For instance, modeling and simulation has been proven in both industry and government to help reduce the time, resources, and ultimately risk associated with systems development. Representations of proposed systems, basically virtual prototypes, are embedded in realistic synthetic environments to support the various phases of the acquisition process. The JSF program has made extensive use of MNS in the requirements development process and is continuing the use of MNS with mission level virtual pilot in the loop simulation to support a more thorough evaluation of required avionics capabilities. And in keeping with the best proven, proven practice in the commercial technology world, virtual manufacturing and virtual maintenance are also being pursued to facilitate planning and drive down the associated costs. The JSF is also incorporating an evolutionary acquisition strategy. In this process, the warfighter and the buyer work side by side to facilitate a better understanding of the requirements and decisions on trade-offs between performance and cost. Specifying operational requirements in an incremental manner, phased over time, and matching them against the projected threat and available technologies have allowed the JSF program to exercise thoughtful judgment in balancing cost, schedule, and performance. The use of evolutionary acquisition further mitigates risks by allowing technologies to be inserted as they mature. As I mentioned before, probably the most important change in the new 5000 rewrite is the emphasis on technology maturity before entering into system integration, or what is today known as engineering and manufacturing development. Of course, transition into EMD is a challenge in every program. In the JSF program, as in others, it will be up to the design teams and the program office along with the service acquisition executives and the defense acquisition executive to determine the acceptable level of technology readiness prior to an EMD decision. Among the many factors that can help us make overall technology readiness assessments are technology readiness levels, or TRLs, which are used sometimes in the DOD. The minimum TRL rating of one begins at paper studies, as Mr. Rodriguez said, of a technology's basic properties and rises to the maximum rating of nine for a system in its final form operating under mission conditions. However, there is no hard and fast rule in DOD, NASA, or elsewhere in government as to specific threshold TRLs for any given decision. Additionally, it should be noted that there are more comprehensive methodologies that we do use which can and do provide more value as risk management as opposed to risk measurement tools. Indeed, the DOD 5000 rewrite does not prescribe a requ required technology readiness level, but does recommend using TRLs as a to tool to help measure the maturity level of the technology. What the 5000 does prescribe is that technologies be demonstrated in a relevant environment with a fallback plan at a higher maturity level. In other words, if a far-reaching newer technology does not pass relevant, relevant testing, a lesser proven technology could be utilized as long as it enables the system to still achieve its critical performance requirements. Recently, the GAO provided a draft report to the department on the JSF that recommends extending the JSF development schedule to allow for further maturation of technologies. Their recommendation is based on their understanding that critical technologies will have inadequate levels of technology maturity based on TRLs at the time the EMD contract is to be awarded and the decision made in the spring of 2001. The GAO report cr clearly articulates a strategy for systems development that we embrace, as evidenced by the revisions to the DOD 5000 I mentioned earlier. Indeed, for the most part, we are in violent agreement. Where we differ is on the definition and applicability of TRLs in the decision-making process. GAO's position does appear to be that achieving a TRL level of seven should be required to prior to entering EMD, again, as Mr. Rodriguez pointed out. Our view, however, is that a level seven requires the very kind of systems in in integration that takes place during EMD, and that it is infeasible to produce full-scale testing of this type prior to that phase. Moreover, as noted earlier, we, like NASA and others, see TRLs as but one input to the decision process. In fact, as the NASA Director of Programs told us, and I quote, NASA does not formally use nor rigorously apply the definition of technology readiness level, TRL, to its systems development. We generally commit to development of operational systems when all critical technologies have achieved TRLs of five or six. 
In assessing a technology prior to EMD, we do seek to, to assess whether the individual technology has been proven or is close to being proven in appropriate developmental environments. We do not agree that it is necessary or even feasible to demonstrate the full integration of the technology prior to EMD. Indeed, the GAO report does seem to require that all technology must be flown on an actual or prototype JSF platform in order to demonstrate adequate maturity for EMD. However, much of the JSF avionics and software, for example, can and should be demonstrated on the ground at a lower cost. Technologies that must be flown for adequate demonstration will in fact be or have been flying on the concept demonstrator aircraft, commercial aircraft, the F-16, the F-22, the FA-18EF, and the Eurofighter. So in short, although the technology will not be demonstrated on the actual JSF or a JSF prototype per se, it will be tested in a relevant environment. And the success of those demonstrations is critical to our confidence in our ability to successfully integrate the technologies during EMD. And we are confident we will have all critical technologies at an adequate and appropriate technology readiness level by the time an EMD decision must be made next year. And I emphasize that the decision is not to be made for another year. GAO has also expressed concern that if we make a premature production decision, we could be locked into manufacturing processes based on an expected technology capability, thus creating the risk that if the integration fails, we will face exorbitant cost and time in redevelopment. We agree there is risk. There is always risk in the integration of complex systems. And how the JSF program mitigates those risks is the key. As I think you will hear from Major General Hewitt, the risk mitigation initiatives associated with JSF have probably been the most comprehensive and aggressive of any DOD program ever. Further, as I noted before, the rapid maturation of modeling and simulation capabilities has enabled the development and testing of a wide range of critical technologies that might not otherwise been possible and has played a key role in our ability to effectively assess the risks on the JSF program. Thus, any decision to proceed into EMD and production of the JSF will carefully assess all risks against the fallback alternatives. Finally, let me be very clear. The strategy I have articulated for the revised acquisition process that will be prescribed in the DOD 5000 rewrite and which is largely being implemented on the JSF does represent a very real departure from our traditional approach to systems development. In the past, we would indeed consider technology development as part of the engineering and manufacturing phase. Now we have technology development before we make a commitment to proceed into system development and demonstration and eventually into production. Mr. Chairman, acquisition reform has been made possible by a strong partnership between the Congress and the executive branch. It reflects our mutual commitment to ensuring that the government operates far more efficiently and effectively than has historically been the case. I appreciate having had this opportunity to be here today because as we continue on the successful path we have forged, we need the continued commitment and support of the Congress. We also appreciate the continued support and encouragement the GAO has provided as we continue to change the world's largest buying institution. Our disagreement on the specific role of TRLs notwithstanding, we are in close agreement on where the DOD systems acquisition process must go. <clears throat> we also believe it is important to let programs like JSF that are demonstrating the acquisition and management reforms of recent years to have the flexibility to manage their programs and make decisions based on weighing the risks against cost, schedule, and technology maturity. That concludes my statement. I would be happy to answer any of your questions now and certainly stand ready to provide any additional information the committee believes would be helpful in fostering a clearer understanding of this or other DOD programs. Thank you, Mr. Soloway. That was a very helpful statement and we did allow you to go over the 10 minutes. I, um because I think it's important for you uh, and DOD to really state your case on the record, and then we can examine your statement. I, I don't think I'll be as generous with the third panel. Uh, we'll stick with the 10 minutes, but... Thank you, sir. It, uh, pardon me? Two minutes. Uh, General, now you only have two minutes. <laughs> so. That's the way it usually works between OSD and the services, sir. <laughs> General, you have, um, you have your time, and uh, we, we welcome your testimony. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I, I appreciate the opportunity here to talk about the Joint Strike Fighter program and the significant accomplishments it's demonstrated in the area of acquisition reform. Uh, by way of background, for those of you on the committee who I haven't had the opportunity to meet, I, I have been in the operational end of the warfighting business for most of my career. I flew the F-105 Thunder Chief in combat in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam conflict. 
Since then, I've flown several other attack aircraft, A7s, A10s, F18s, almost every model of the F16. I was a wing commander during the Persian Gulf War. And since then, in my headquarters experience, I've been the deputy director of operational requirements and almost two years in this acquisition position as the mission area director responsible for fighters, bombers, and munitions, and the JSF program falls in that category. Now, the JSF program has been a leader in the implementation of acquisition reform since its inception as the Joint Advanced Strike Technology Program or the JAS program. You may recall that combined uh, the multi-role fighter uh, program uh, and after we canceled AX, helped to meet uh, joint service requirements. Uh, now, the, the need to produce an affordable aircraft drove several key decisions early in the program, including a single engine, a single seat, and a common family of airplanes for all three services. Uh, specific advanced technologies were selected and then prioritized based on their contribution to not only warfighting benefits, but also in terms of life cycle costs. Uh, we established uh, aggressive cost goals uh, for average unit recurring flyaway cost and for engineering and manufacturing development. And cost goals are being established uh, even now for life cycle costs. Now, these cost goals continue to serve as baseline independent variables for requirements and technology affordability trades. And, and I'll talk about that regard a minute because this is a new process that we've gone through is a robust and highly successful cost and operational performance trade process that's been implemented by the Joint Strike Fighter on a continuous basis in order to help achieve a, uh, those cost goals. Participation by the three major stakeholders in this process, our warfighters, industry, and the government, has been key to the success of this cost and operational performance trade process. The warfighters represented by both operators and maintainers continue to provide a clear and unambiguous uh, view on warfighting concepts and needs, as well as expected threats and combat conditions. And industry provides us with detailed weapon system concept and cost information, and the program office adds an understanding of cost, schedule, performance, so supportability and resource constraints. M more importantly, government engineers and analysts pre present assessments on the cost and performance of contractor concepts. The result is that every requirement on this airplane has to earn its way onto the airplane based on cost effectiveness or cost benefit analysis. Now, in contrast to some programs which are not initiated until a formal validated requirements document existed, the Joint Strike Fighter program was established so that specific weapon system requirements would not be frozen until the leveraging cost and operational performance trades had been performed and key technologies and concepts had been matured. This just-in-time approach to requirements <coughs> avoided premature commitment to requirements that would be excessively costly to meet, fail to take advantage of available technology, or conversely depend upon immature technology. In other words, it allowed time to work down the cost of the weapon system and ensure that the requirements are consistent with available technology. I'd like to spend just a few minutes discussing the current phase of the concept demonstration phase that we're in. This phase began in November of 96 and is scheduled to be complete in the spring of next year. Uh, the major activities during this phase are propulsion system development, the requirements analysis and definition, the technology maturation programs, and of course building and flying two concept demonstrator aircraft per contractor. Uh, in regards to the concept demonstrator aircraft, I want to emphasize a couple points to the committee. These aircraft are concept demonstrator aircraft. They are not and were never intended to be prototypes. These demonstrator aircraft are required in the concept demonstration phase to accomplish three very specific objectives. One, to demonstrate a high degree of commonality across all those three common service variants, to demonstrate short takeoff and landing, the, the vertical landing, hover, and transition to and from forward flight, and then demonstrate satisfactory low speed carrier approach flying and handling qualities. In fact, there are other items to be demonstrated by the contractors on these airplanes, uh, but these are for competitive advantage purposes. But the hard requirements are the three things I listed above. We are totally convinced the JSF program office and our contractor teams have done a great job in ensuring that the concept development phase of this program will demonstrate a low level of technology risk for critical enabling technology and processes prior to entering EMD in the early part of next year on the current schedule. This has been accomplished through a very rigorous and disciplined methodology for risk assessment, risk management, and risk reduction. 
Now, Pratt & Whitney is developing engines for both the JSF contractors' demonstrator aircraft based on their highly successful development program for the F-22. The result here is a high degree of commonality, not only among the JSF contractors, but also between the Joint Strike Fighter and the F-22. The F-119 engine core is essentially the same for both the F-22 and the Joint Strike Fighter. This commonality lowers JSF risk, development time, life cycle cost, and accel accelerates that propulsion system maturity so that we can provide a safer airplane for our warfighters. Under the current schedule, in fact, we expect to have over 500,000 hours of operational F-22 engine time before we put that engine at, at initial operational capability in the JSF. This is more than double what we had on the F-15, F-100 engine when we transi transitioned it to the single engine F-16. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to just talk a little bit about the last two concept demonstrator de de concept development goals, technology maturation and concept demonstrator aircraft a bit further. The, the JSF program identified numerous technology maturation efforts to ensure low risk into engineering and manufacturing development. Now these technology maturation efforts aim to fulfill two key recommendations of the 1985-86 Packard Commission, to apply advanced technology to reduce costs not just to increase performance, and to demonstrate advanced technologies prior to the start of EMD. In the single acquisition management plan, the SAMP, that was signed by Dr. Kaminsky in November of 96, it clearly states that the goal of the TechMAT program is to evolve the most promising leading edge technologies to a low level of risk prior to integration in the JSF EMD program. It's important to emphasize that integration and its corresponding risk is and always was to be addressed in EMD. Exit criteria from the concept development phase states that the Joint Strike Fighter will demonstrate to a low level of technical risk those critical enabling technologies, processes, and system characteristics. Integration on a JSF program is the focus of EMD. Now, the Joint Strike Fighter Program Office, in conjunction with each competing contractor, identified critical technologies, processes, and system characteristics required for the program tailored to their own designs. Robust risk management processes were established by each competing contractor and validated by the program office. The government did not specify to the contractors which techniques must be used to track risk. The contractors selected what they felt were the best methodologies to, de to accomplish that task. Now, the government has been provided real-time access to those systems, actually on a computer da database, for oversight and review during the entire phase of the program. Both contractors utilize what is known as waterfall charts using a Willoughby template. This is a common and accepted methodology in industry and government. In fact, it's taught at our Defense Systems Management College, where risk has been identified, baselined, and tracked to document the very specific events required to reduce the risk of these cr critical technologies, processes, and system characteristics to a low level of risk prior to EMD initiation. Implementation of that risk management strategy has not changed since the program entered the concept development phase in 1996. And most significantly, all of the critical technologies have achieved or are on track to achieve a low level of risk prior to the start of EMD. I want to assure the committee that DOD is convinced that our JSF weapon system contractors are appropriately reducing the risk of these technologies through an affordable mix of flight and ground demonstrations, component demonstrations, and modeling and simulation and analysis. Based on a request from the Subcommittee on Military Procurement of the House Armed Services Committee, both our JSF prime contractors and Pratt & Whitney recently reaffirmed in detailed written responses, which were also shared with the GAO, that sufficient testing and demonstration is in place for the Joint Strike Fighter Program to enter EMD at low risk. In summary, clearly, since the program's inception almost six years ago, the program office has been following a rigorous risk reduction plan. The risk reduction plan is on track to reduce the risk of each technology to low by entry into EMD and leave the integration of those technologies to the EMD phase where it belongs. This risk reduction effort has been an important part of the program's overall goals to implement acquisition reform. This Joint Strike Fighter is vital to the modernization of all of our services air forces and many of our closest allies. Any significant delay to the program would result in increased costs and also have serious impacts on our force structure and readiness. This was highlighted in detail in a recent 2 May Deputy Secretary of Defense letter to our service's most senior leadership. That letter was addressed to each of the service secretaries 
to the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, and the Chief of Naval Operations. The JSF program was chartered to do business differently and to demonstrate leadership and acquisition reform, and it has done this. Having embraced these concepts, it was rewarding to those who have worked so hard in this program to be presented the DOD uh, David Packard Excellence in Acquisition Award in March of 97. All of this has been accomplished under the twin goals of developing an affordable weapons system that, that can meet the warfighter's needs well into the 21st century while helping to reform the acquisition process. So, Mr. Chairman, when you ask, Joint Strike Fighter, acquisition reform, will it fly? My answer to you is JSF has already demonstrated acquisition reforms as called for by Congress, and it will continue to write the book that future programs will follow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's great to have you both here, and it's, uh, your statements were helpful. And um, I, I'd like to uh, ask a number of questions, uh, stating first that I think we, uh, on both sides of the table, agree that uh, JSF is uh, a, a necessary program. Uh, it, it, we're going to see this plane built in all its variations. And so it's just really a, a question of how to proceed. And, um, but I do think there are some substantive differences between GAO and, and, um, and your position, DOD's position, and, and I'd like to, to investigate that a little bit. But I'd also like to uh, acknowledge you know, where we may agree, so then, then, we can, then we can just really focus on where we need to focus on. The bottom line is that the, um, the new attack fighter, the AFX for the Navy, and the multi-role fighter, M MRF for the Air Force, is dropped, and we don't see any um, hope or need uh, to resurrect that. That's pretty much off the table. So it, it makes JSF even more important. I think we both can agree, and so you nodded your heads, and I take that as a, a yes. Uh, you're going to have to speak. Actually, it's very hard, isn't it, That's to true. take a nod and never head. <laughs> okay. Since I didn't address it to one, I understand. When, um, so I'll, I'll start with you, Mr. Soloway. And uh, General Hewitt, uh, if you disagree, um, the, you certainly would step in. So I'll assume if, if Mr. Soloway says, uh, gives the answer, you are in agreement with him and vice versa. Okay. Is that fair enough? Um, the, uh, so um, uh, the AFX and the MRF are off the table, uh, and we agree that JSF, Joint Strike Fighter, is, is, is our next plane uh, in addition to the F-22. And um, the um, FA-18 ENF. Uh, would you agree with um, GAO that the um, FA-18 ENF is a significantly different plane, uh, almost a brand new plane, or would you uh, uh, contend that it is a variation on a plane that we already have? Uh, I'll ask both of you. Or Actually, General Hewitt okay, has the General Hewitt. Hewitt. Fine. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I really don't feel qualified to to provide a specific answer there. I don't know that much about the specific differences between okay. those two aircraft. Well, I've always known uh, the uh, non-military side to be willing to give an answer on this, so Mr. <laughs> Soloway. But I've already passed to the general. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, uh, so uh, that's going to be, it's going to stand, basically, that comment that it is a significantly different plane by the GAO if, if it's not refuted. That, that would be my understanding, but we can certainly get you more detail okay, on what the differences enough. are. It may be appropriate, Mr. Chairman, to go to the Navy and get answer that question okay, for the fair record. enough. Um, the, um, Uh, w we would agree that the joint JSF is uh, intended to do uh, three basic tasks um, for the Air Force, a conventional uh, airplane, a tactical airplane, uh, for uh, the Navy, slow speed, uh, a, a structure that has to be a little more durable to take the harder landings and the shorter landings, and uh, for the Marines, uh, a vertical takeoff, and those are uh, General, I make an assumption, uh, three very different uh, tasks. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, and probably the best way to clarify that is for the Air Force, the Joint Strike Fighter will replace F-16s right. and A-10s. Uh, yeah. For the Marine Corps, they will replace the AV-8s and some of their F-18s, and for the Navy, they will complement their F-18 EF force. 
But in, in, the in, in, in the three variants of the airplane, there, there are, you know, we, we achieve, uh, we, we plan to achieve a high degree of commonality, and right now that appears to be somewhere between 70 and 80 percent commonality between each of the three variants. There is the conventional takeoff and landing variant for the Air Force, there is the carrier suited, uh, suited, suited variant for the Navy, and the Stovall variant, the, uh, the uh, um, short takeoff and vertical land variant uh, that will satisfy the needs not only for our Marine Corps, but also for some of our foreign participants, notably the United Kingdom. Uh, things like the avionics would be similar in all three? Uh, right now, the avionics are planned to be common across right. all three yeah, variants. Exactly. So some, some will be the same. Signi some significant savings there in terms of commonality. Uh, but, but admittedly, we tried this in the past where we've tried to have one plane meet the needs of more than one uh, one branch, uh, Navy, Marines, uh, Air Force, and we haven't always had it. It hasn't been all that successful, correct? Uh, I know we've received I, a lot of... I would of say that the F-4 is probably as an example that you, yes. you might refer to that where it didn't meet everyone's requirements. Yeah. Uh, I would point to the fact in this program, and, and as a warfighter, I say this has been a, a great process. This cost and operational performance trade process that I talked about in my oral testimony, this is where we had what we call an ops advisory group, an OAG, a group of warfighters that got together and uh, worked with the contractor in the SPO, the system program office, and we worked this requirements process to evolve the requirements for the services over a five-year period. And in fact, we finally got the final operational requirements document uh, approved by the Joint Requirements Oversight Council. That's a group chaired by the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs and, and with membership with the vice chiefs of each of the services uh, approved on March 13th. And as I said, what we did in there is we went carefully through to make sure that each of the services get the requirements that they need to do their individual job. So you see in each of these variants, there will be some unique requirements to meet unique service requirements, but at the same time, achieve the greatest degree, greatest degree of commonality that we can. Yeah. And, and we but, think we've but done the that. Bottom, but the bottom line is, uh, and, and I accept what you're saying, but the, the F-4 was an example of a plane that didn't do quite enough for any of the, the branches. Uh, it's not to say we shouldn't do it again to try to make it work, but this is a significant undertaking because it's not just for the Navy, and it's not just for the Air Force, it's not just for the Marines, it's for all three, with a variation of, of basically between 20 and 30 percent from one to the other. Um, and I would like to know if you agree or disagree with GAO when they said that in, if the technology development is one dollar, if they haven't developed the technology by production development, a uh, product development, excuse me, that it's ten, uh, and that if they've gotten to the point of production, that it that dollar becomes a hundred dollars. Mr. Chairman, I've never heard those numbers before. Okay, so you would want us to to uh, substantiate those numbers. I would have no yeah. way of commenting on those. Fine. Uh, if you'd speak just a little louder. But your bottom line is you say you have no way of... of uh, fair enough. It intuitively, to me, uh, I, that is not uh, an unrealistic uh, number. In other words, I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case, but I accept for the, for the time being that it hasn't been documented, but it is now part of the record. Uh, as a statement that we need to address. And I think that we can, you know, we will take the question for the record also, but I am not aware of any program that we've ever done that has had a hundredfold increase in cost from... Well, but it, but it may just be that aspect. So that, uh, even that aspect, yeah, I'm, no, I'm just no, not but, aware of any. Yeah, but let me clarify, not, not that the whole program no, goes up, but that particular failure of technology has resulted in, in a, 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 a 10 to 1 in product development and a 100 to 1 in production. So on the table, and your point is you, you, you're not aware of that, that kind of. Um, but intuitively, we would agree the cost would go up significantly, and we have a heck of a lot of past history to document that that's the case. Now, um, I see a difference between the logic in um, when you're building a, a school building, it, your technology uh, is there, but you haven't designed it. And so you say, let's do it all at once, and, and uh, in many cases it's proved to be cheaper and you get the product sooner. You don't wait to design everything. Some things happen in process. But this is a bit different, correct? I can't use that same analogy, and the DOT, DOD would be 
uh, wouldn't use that same analogy, correct? What, what I would say, sir, on, on, that, on that question is that we are, in fact, demonstrating the critical path technologies prior to going into EMD. The difference really comes down to how one defines technology readiness levels as a means of measuring uh, where you are in that process. We are not entering into EMD where we have critical path technologies that either don't exist or we haven't demonstrated in what we call a relevant environment. Uh, but the difference really comes down to, and if you look, for instance, at the way in which the technology readiness levels are defined even in the GAO report, where at level six, they talk in terms of system or subsystem models or prototypes demonstration in a relevant environment. We will have done that, I believe, on every technology, every critical path technology prior to EMD. Level seven speaks to a system prototype. We, could, could someone put up that chart that the GAO had? It was the... It was figure four in their report. That's the, the technologies one through eight. But my only point was going to be as, as when I know, you but you're making reference to Alyssa. Let's, let's just leave it up. Thank you very much. When, when you talk in terms of technology readiness level seven, which Mr. Rodriguez said they believe should be the threshold test before you go into engineering, manufacturing, development, our view on that is that the definition of TRL seven speaks to a system prototype demonstration in an operational environment. That suggests to us that you have had to do a great deal of both systems engineering and systems integration, because you're dealing here with a system of systems, in essence. What does it mean, though, when they say in a test bed aircraft? A test bed aircraft could be any aircraft you're flying to test a given technology. It might not be one aircraft, which I said in my testimony, we have the, the CDA, we have the, we're using commercial aircraft, the F-16s, F-18s, F-22s, Eurofighter, various different technologies that need to fly will fly in an aircraft and then there's the no, test. But, they, but, but it isn't a prototype then. I mean, they No, can, it's not a prototype. No. no so That's that, correct. That's the key difference. Let me, let me say, okay, the, the question that my counsel is asking almost is who said it was? I mean, are you putting up a straw man that you're now taking? Who said, that, I'm sorry. That it was a prototype. It, it says under the definition of technology readiness levels in the GAO report in, of uh, yeah. uh, last July, the definition of level seven is a system prototype demonstration. And I think if we, and without trying said, to get... And then it says examples include testing the prototype in a test Testing the aircraft. prototype. Yeah, so I mean, we have, we have eight basic uh, technologies and they don't have to technically be tested on a prototype plane. They can be tested on another plane, correct? They, they, they could, so... But, but, well, you get, into the, you get into various discussions, for instance, on some of the time. We can't get into specific Yeah, but let me just say, I think this is a key point. It is and, a very and, key point. Yeah, I agree. Okay. And, and it would be wrong to suggest that somehow you have to have a prototype. The question is, can you test it in other ways to know it works before we move well, forward with development? Sir, actually, you, the, 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 and I'm going to give you sort of how I read their chart, and then General Hewitt may have a different okay. sort of interpretation. I think there's actually a great deal of gray area about TRLs are not quite as clear as has been defined, and I think that's one of the reasons NASA and others have said that there's right. some, you have to have some flexibility. And that's here, one reason let why me use the, yeah. the language out of the report says examples include testing the prototype in a test bed aircraft. So you have to have a prototype of the system. Now, does that mean in a full form fit and function where, for instance, the radar array has to be the full size, full scale that you're going to use, or if technology allows you to, would you be testing a variant of the radar where the basic technology exists on a, for instance, an F-18 or some other aircraft. Others would be in the avionics, as, as I noted, and I believe General Hewitt has talked to, the avionics don't necessarily need to be flown in a, on, a, in a, on a test bed aircraft. They can be tested in, a, in an environment which is tremendously, um, has great integrity with regard to the operational requirements. So it's, it's not an automatic, in our view, threshold that says you have to test everything in a prototype, which involves essentially full scale for each individual technology. Do you want to add to that, John? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, could I, could I make sure. just, just a... Let uh, me just ask this point, though. The laboratory goes to, from one to three, correct? And then it gets out of the laboratory. Well, you know, those definitions become fuzzy in the sense that in order to demonstrate something, some technologies to a low level, you don't necessarily have to fly them at all. You may be able to do that in an environment that never involves putting that technology in an airplane. Right. Uh, and so what the program did, let me talk about what the program did a little bit. We, the program did not use technology readiness levels primarily because they didn't include a risk management process. 
What they did do is they used these waterfall ch uh, charts or Willoughby templates where they identified all of the key technologies that needed to be reduced to low risk before going into EMD. Now these, the, this process uh, identifies the technology and then lays out over a schedule the critical events that have to happen to reduce that specific technology to a low level of readiness. In addition to that, it provides off-ramps, if you would, where if that technology is not going to work, they would revert to an alternate technology. Now, this was chosen by the contractors as a way of not only assessing risk, which the TRL uh, process does, but also managing risk and being sure that you get to that low level of risk when you're ready to go into EMD. And that's the process that they used, and that's the process that the program office monitored each of the contractors on a computer so, database. So where you both agree, and then we'll define it, uh, you both agree that you shouldn't go into EMD before right. those critical technologies. No, no before you uh, come to low-level risk. Exactly. Okay. Precisely. So, so it, it, the debate now is whether what you describe as low-level risk is low-level risk. I mean, that's going to be no, but but because you you buy into the point though that you don't move forward if you're at high-level risk, and high-level risk is where you don't have the technology. There's always, as I said in my testimony, when you're dealing particularly in this kind of complexity of systems, the risk of integration, which is what you do in EMD, is always there. I mean, to say that there's, we can whittle that risk down to a very low level and this level of complexity is, is not realistic. What we are looking to do, just to make sure we're clear on the terminology, is to arrive at a very low level of risk relative to the individual technologies. Okay, let me just tell you what, what makes me nervous. You have described um, you basically have described the um, technical readiness levels as tools rather than requirements. And then you're doing one thing more, as I hear it. You're also, in a sense, redefining low-level risk. And I thought at least we could get to the point where we agree uh, you don't move forward with, unless you're at low-level risk. You're trying to qualify low-level risk in a way that makes me uncomfortable. No, I, I just don't want to leave on the table a suggestion that when you go to the integration into EMD that your risks are automatically low. What you have done is substanti substantially reduce your risk no, by I, I, proving I, I, the individual technologies. But you still have a high-risk element because this is a complex undertaking. Well, um, a I, I'm just going to tell you, that leaves me a little uneasy because that, that allows you to, to define it in a way that allows you to move forward no matter, no, no, as I, I hear you. No, but, but I'm, we would, in the past, we would not necessarily, in all of our systems development, bring individual technologies to the level of maturity that, we are, that the JSF is doing and that we will now be requiring in the new 5000 rewrite. That's the individual technology levels. To get further than that into an integrated system, is what you do in engineering and manufacturing development. Now, that is always, uh, there's always risk there, as I said in my testimony. We have reduced that risk by proving out the individual technologies. That's the big step forward that we've taken over previous practice. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm dealing with a moving target here. And I know you're trying to be helpful and you're trying to be responsive. What I want to say, and then we'll just have our disagreements. Uh, what I want to say to you is you view uh, technical readiness levels as a tool. Um, I view them as something more than a tool. I view them as, uh, as more a requirement, and you view it more as a tool. I view low-level risk as obviously in, when you're dealing with uh, military hardware, uh, and it, it, there are risks, but I think that, that low-level and high-level is pretty clear. And uh, then it, it, there are going to be different levels of low risk. Now, where, where I may um, have some um, question is if you've, if you've leveled, if, if so much of one technology, um, say the structures and materials, you, you've got almost everything licked but one thing, and that one thing is still there, but you don't want to hold up the rest of the project because everything else is ready. I would think that you may still have something that needs to be resolved, and you wouldn't want to wait another year for the whole project if you want to start to integrate 
these technologies together. So I may be a little off in that, and I'll, I'll, I'll um, you know, ask J.O. To, to help me out on this later as well, and, and other witnesses. All I'm saying to you is, I'm uncomfortable by you referring to this as a tool, and you're redefining low-level risk. That's where I'm uncomfortable. Um, let me do this. I'm going to come back. I'm going to let uh, uh, council and uh, minority staff uh, ask questions as well, because in the process of their asking questions, it helps define what I uh, want to continue to ask. So, Mr. Halloran. Yeah, why don't we go? Thank you. <coughs> Uh, this is David R Rapallo. Could you just describe what effects, you mentioned uh, briefly in your statements, what effects a delay would have? A delay of, say, six months. Good question. Sure. I wrote down some specific notes to talk to that. Uh, I think probably the the uh, the best source of information there now, there was an attachment to uh, Mr. De Leon's letter to our to our senior service leadership that talked about the impacts of delays. Obviously, if you delay the program any period of time, uh, you are going to incur some in costs of incre increased costs in in the program itself. But, but more importantly, in this particular case, you're looking at uh, a delay in development that could roll into a delay in production that could be more than six months. And, and if you'll go back and look at the history of programs, uh, some delays in development of a program have led to just that. If, if you were to incur any kind of a significant delay here, uh, we would have some force structure impacts and some impacts on our readiness. The, the DEPSECDEF letter attachment uh, looked at a scenario that went out as much as three years and said if you delayed the program procurement phase by three years, that we would end up with about a three fighter wing equivalent uh, uh, force structure uh, that we'd have to deal with in a couple of different ways. You could buy uh, gap filler aircraft, F-16, more F-16s, or you could do service life extensions to those, program to those aircraft if they were possible. Now, we've done service life extensions to F-16, so in general, we think that's probably a doable deal. The Marines, though, it appears that they would not have uh, that kind of an option where there really isn't felt to be, in, in my view or my understanding, a viable way to carry the AV-8 further in the future. And so they would end up with a force structure deficit in order to uh, meet their military commitments worldwide. And, and uh, without getting into the details of what, the, what that would mean in terms of their ability to do their mission, uh, that attachment in the DEPSECDEF's letter talked about some of those impacts to our sinks uh, worldwide. So we think in the long run that there are some very significant impacts if, if you would uh, slip this in terms of force structure and readiness impacts. I might add one other point to that in terms of cost, that the longer we delay a decision, and I don't want to suggest that the decision is, and I, Mr. Chairman, you asked the question, or one of the members asked the question earlier about what is sacrosanct about a certain time frame for a decision. We set out a time frame in which we thought we could make that decision, and we still believe that within a year we're going to be able to make an EMD decision. But it is driven by our requirement of having the technology maturity where we think it needs to be to make that decision, not by any arbitrary line in the sand. But presuming for a moment that we have what we believe are adequate levels of technology maturity, you have to realize that we'd be delaying that decision and for a longer period of time carrying both contractors, for instance, which is going to continue costs and uh, so forth. We would have an impact on our international partners who are participating in the program and the potential either pull out or other uh, reopeners, if you will, in terms of the international relationship. So there are a number of sort of follow-on impacts that could, that could transpire as well. I want Mr. Rapallo to, to, to continue to develop his line of reasoning, but I, I, I just want to ask you um, um, the question, again, you say adequate levels of technology maturity, and that's just a different term than low level. 
and we, adequate is, leaves me really yeah, and, and I apologize if I, if I seem to be obfuscating, because I really wasn't, sir. When, when you made the comment that, that we would be, have low risk, Right. We will have low risk relative to the individual technologies. Yes, that is a requirement, okay. Okay. That is, and that is a requirement. What is not a requirement necessarily is that TRLs be the measure of that risk. We are recommending TRLs, by the way, in the new 5000 just as a common language, but there are, as General Hewitt said, other ways in which one assesses, measures, and manages to risk mitigation and risk management uh, other than TRLs. They themselves are not the only. I'm going to go back to you a second. So, You've made the point that the Harrier I call it the Harrier jet. Is that the, the British term for it? Um, uh, but but the vertical takeoff jet is uh, is deteriorating significantly. It's it it needs to be replaced soon. The question mark is: Do you speed up everything because of that? And and uh, one of the questions, I I have total acceptance that if you're in production and then we in Congress do what we sometimes do, we say instead of. 30 planes, it's 20 planes, we add costs. I understand that. I understand how if we slow things in production, but frankly, sometimes the technology isn't there or is being revised, that's one of the costs uh, of, of slowing it down. But I have a harder time understanding how slowing down the decision before you go into development and, and, and production uh, adds significantly to costs. And I'll just have you come to that question afterwards, but you had mentioned it, and I just want to, and I'd love you to, to continue your line of question. That would be my only follow-up, is GAO has sort of stated or described a process where if you delay the EMD process, uh, you can develop the technologies and ultimately save money and save time. Do you disagree with that? No, I don't disagree with that, but on this given program, I think what we're saying is we would not go into EMD if we did not have the technologies developed, so that the delay in time is not necessarily going to help. We believe the technologies will be uh, at a level that allows us to make a responsible decision to move to EMD. Uh, now, whether we agree that based on a TRL chart, if one were to use that measure, one would need to be at TRL 7 or 6, that's, that is actually the crux of the debate. And what does it require to, to achieve a TRL 7 under the, the, the construct? But, but clearly, if the technologies are not there, you cannot, and particularly the, the critical path technologies we're talking about, then you wouldn't make that decision. So in this case, all we're saying is to say today that we ought to delay the program when we believe the technologies are either there or close to there and will be there in the time frame, there would be no reason to delay. Otherwise, if the technologies aren't there, that's correct. You would not want to go into EMD. You'd want to take advantage of further development time. Mr. Powell, thank you. If you want to come back, we will. Um, Mr. Halloran. OK, thanks. Um, well, I guess. Follow-up that occurs to them is you, you believe the technology will be ready. How will you know if not with some more quantitative or objective measure than TRLs? How will you know that, say, the vertical takeoff and, and landing technology, for example, speaking hypothetically, um, how will you know whether it's ready or not? How will you measure that? Well, you, you have first of all, there are, as, as General Hewitt said, that there are things. Some people call the Willoughby templates, and so there are other methodologies that are used. And you may, I think, hear from one of your. Uh, other witnesses in terms of probability as well as objective measures and so forth. Yeah. But the other reality is, and I don't mean to be glib when I say this, is it's either going to be working or it's not. It's, it's either the, the, the capability to do what you were talking about is either have been demonstrated or not demonstrated on a concept aircraft or what have you. The radar or what, whatever technology you're talking about will have or will have not been demonstrated on another plane. The avionics will or will not have uh, been demonstrated in a suitable laboratory environment. And actually, when the chairman mentioned laboratories at level one to three, there is a category in level six that talks about a high fidelity laboratory, which is different than sort of that, the, the, the low grade. So we will have actually demonstrated the individual technologies in a variety of different ways, most relevant to what we have to, t to prove and see. I think the short answer there is that we will continue this rigorous and disciplined approach that we've had using these risk waterfalls to track each one of these technologies and assure that it's a low level of risk. And in fact, in the input that we got from Boeing and Lockheed and Pratt & Whitney in the inputs requested by the House Armed Services Committee, the Subcommittee on Military Procurement, they went through in great detail in each of the technologies describing the process that they were using and 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 reaffirming that we would be at low level of risk prior to entry into EMD. That is really the tool that we have been using. And it is a risk management tool that tracks its event-based. And it also, again, allows you to make decisions 
uh, if you need to go to an alternate technology to be at low risk prior to EMD. Well, key point. Stay with that for a second and describe this, this, the waterfall really again, because what, what I heard, I think what the chairman heard was that high risk plus a risk mitigation plan equals low risk. And no, I, not a plan. You have to execute the plan, and then you monitor the plan to assure you've gotten there. So the program, and that's exactly what the Wait. program, in a quantitative way, the program office goes through, and as the contractor completes each of the events that they've agreed are to track this from high risk to medium risk to low risk, they check them off. And so you end up essentially with a checklist that says you are at low risk in that technology area. You have done all the things that you said you needed to do to get there. Let me just add one other thing, if I could, on that point. Once you've done that, you also, and General Hewitt mentioned a couple of times, fallbacks. And I think it's important to understand that as you go through this process, you, for, let's, let's say, for instance, that we have a technology that was demonstrated on an F-16 and that we thought, well, this is ready to go. And for some reason, as we get forward, it doesn't work. What do we have to have done prior to EMD to address that potentiality? And that is where the fallback is. You have to have an assessment of what lower level capabilities you can access right. and without affecting the critical performance parameters of the plane. And cost? Certainly. And the, because that, I'm glad you, I was going there next anyway, glad you raised that, because GAO made the point that in a couple of these critical areas, the fallback was quite expensive and did affect performance or, or the, re the requirements, adding weight, for example. Um, and yet, you testified that the 5000 series calls for a fallback that it would be at a, at a higher TRL or, a, or at a... Uh, the fallback itself, if it's measured independently as a TRL, will be higher, but, it's rel but it might be, not be as high, tech, high a technology. So it, but it involves a trade-off of some kind. There's a trade-off, certainly, and you have to assess all of that in this process. And you have critical performance parameters that you have to meet, right. and you can't go below that. Um, let me change the subject slightly and, and talk about the the definitional threshold between technology maturation and integration. It, it struck me that in, in rescoring the original uh, contractor's TRL scoring, um, the department kind of expanded the definition of integration to, to, to get itself off from under some low scores here and to push things up to sixes and sevens where you could define your risks uh, more clearly or at least as lower. Um, so talk about that, that threshold some more. I mean, integration. There's an example in some testimony that comes in a minute of, of, of a DOD system that looked fine in pieces, but when they did come together, they interfered with each other and didn't work. Um, and that's clearly an integration issue, and that's a separate set of risks, as you, as you testify. Um, but is getting to demonstration of form, fit, and function in a, in a proper environment, is that integration or is that maturization, Matur you know, maturity? I would suggest that the way it's, the, if, if you're taking that comment and weighing against the way TRLs are laid out and what levels you hit, because that's sort of the context of the question, that you have to do a fair amount of integration to, to, do, to do that. Um, so my, my answer would be yes, we think that, let me go back to your initial question, because what you really were asking was, did we try to jimmy numbers to get out from under a bad score? I mean, that was the first question. And my answer is, and, and I can say this as one who was not involved in that initial process, but have gone back. Uh, over the last month or two and have met with all of the players. We've had extensive discussions, services, and so forth. I genuinely believe that there was, uh, despite what Mr. Rodriguez said, a lack of understanding of how these were being applied. Because what was being done was assessing levels relative to the risk of systems integration. For the, this is for the JSF. And so when you do that, you are, you, your relative risk is higher. But when you're weighing it against a question of have you proven out the individual technology, which is what we believe and what the 5,000 really speaks to in the new 5,000, needs to be matured in a way we've not traditionally done before, before you go to EMD, when you do that, that is the, re the result is the rescored numbers. But what was the source of the misunderstanding? As you say, the 5,000 draft had been out a while. It, it, I suspect no, 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 no. This, it, had, it had reached some, it had received some resistance. Had, this was not relative to the 5,000 rewrite. This was relative to the GAO but, interaction. But the issue the, and the, pr the proposed role of TRLs, as you state in your testimony, that at some point push would come to shove and that a, a low TRL would prevent a technology from moving in, into EMD, that was pretty well known. What was the source of the misunderstanding? How to grade TRLs. Yeah, the program I, office had never used TRLs. When they graded them to come up with these ratings that you see on the chart, they rated those including the risk of integration on the Joint Strike Fighter. And of course, that's going to give you a much higher risk, and that's why the lower ratings. 
They did not rate the individual technology area uh, by itself without consideration of the risk of integration on JSA. When they went back and did that, in fact, that was uh, spelled out in Dr. Schneider's letter that responded to the GAO report. And uh, he made it very clear that the department position was that the department does not agree with the conclusion which is based on misinterpretation of a process for determining the readiness of technologies for incorporation into major systems. And went on to say later that the GAO ground rules for scoring the technology readiness levels included the risk of integrating the technology onto the JSF platform. The JSF program office used those ground rules to arrive at the ratings contained in the draft report. And upon review and discussion with other users of technology readiness levels, that program office determined that only the maturity of the technology, not its integration, should be rated to determine the readiness to enter EMD. One finds that technology risk is expected to be an acceptable level of EMD start when you do okay, that. Let's go back then, and then back to my original question, define integration. Integration meaning form, fit, fit and function down to the size it will have to perform next to other systems, or integration meaning actually working with other systems on an airplane. I mean, if you define it that broadly, then of course you, you'll, you'll uh, I think, diminish the use of t the effectiveness of TRLs as a threshold judgment to get into EMD. Well, let me offer just a couple things here. Uh, first of all, it was clear that you know some of these things have to fly on aircraft in order to get to the low level of risk. In fact, if, if you would bear with me just a moment, if we look at those eight technology areas without uh, addressing the eight technologies in specifically, uh, for example, you would technology number four is flying on an F-16. Um, Technology number one is flying on a concept demonstrator aircraft. In fact, a lot of these technology areas will fly on aircraft. But when the program office made their initial assessment using those t the TRL scoring, they included the risk of integration on the JSF platform to score those. Okay. Um, finally, finally uh, Mr. Soloway, in your testimony, in talking about the 5000 series, and you say, and that which is largely being implemented in JSF. Um, speaking more broadly about acquisition reform, now what, in what, in what, in what way is it not? Largely gives you some room out. In what way is it not? In what way? What challenges does the department face in, in more fully applying acquisition reform to this program and others that follow it? Well, you've, you've asked two separate questions. Let me start with the JSF specific, and then move to the broader question, if I could. On the JSF, the, 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 when, you, when we complete the 5,000 rewrite, which is now out for comment, we expect to have it finalized in the next 30 to 60 days. It's been a long process. It's a fairly complex set of documents. There will be actually a new systems acquisition model, if you will, with different kinds of entry and exit criteria based on much of the kind of model that GAO talked about this morning. And this is precisely where we are going in the department and the kinds of criteria that you have to meet to go into various phases of the process, and they may have different names and different, and, and it's sort of a, really a different model. JSF has, in effect, mirrored that model, but not precisely because the model doesn't, didn't even exist until the last several months. Hmm. So it's not a precise marry up in that way. But I think JSF has very much um, reflected what we are seeking to do in the 5,000. On the broader question of what DOD or the Congress needs to do, uh, I think there are, the, the list is quite long in terms of the challenges we face. Part of it is the sort of entrenched cultures that we both have in terms of how we view programs and systems development and how, in some of the issues that you raised with Mr. Rodriguez earlier today. Uh, and that's both an internal DOD problems with Congress and, and, and the external world. Uh, part of it has to do with, um, and I'll give you one example, I think one of the real challenges with the new 5000 rewrite, and this is not relative to JSF, this is a broader question, is if you are in this front end process where you want to and have to uh, uh, demonstrate technologies, you want to also, and, and, and thus not make your, your commitment to EMD and really program commitment until you've gotten to that point, you will also hopefully, as we go down this path, be looking at more options than you might otherwise have been looking at. And what that leads you to is having to avoid or wanting to avoid a program commitment either in the building or from the political environment before you're ready to say, I've got a set of technologies that can get me this capability, and, and, and that's when I'm ready to, to make that commitment. And you know, traditionally, we'd say, we're going to do a new jet, or we're going to do a new ship, 
and then we sort of work it through. But the ship never left the left the table or the, or the plane. It was very, fairly rare once you got that far down the path. What we really want to do is both for ourselves is inject a great deal more discipline. We're, as I said, we have tremendous agreement and, and GAO has been a partner at the table as we've built this model. Uh, but we also have to have discipline in the process to realize that we may want to be looking at different kinds of capabilities and different kinds of mission options before you make those kinds of commitments. And that's traditionally been very difficult, I think, for all of us. Um, so there are a number of challenges that we all face in, in moving this forward. And um, I think that they're very, uh, I think they're challenges we can overcome. And I, I said, I do believe JSF is really the forerunner coming out and, and, and applying many of these principles. The general was talking about the process they went through with the various stakeholders, the different services, a really flexible requirements process driven by what the customer really needed and what they, we believed as we went through the process technology was going to be able to provide in a reasonable period of time so that we didn't end up waiting 18 years or 20 years as has been the case in the past. Finally, let me ask, um, uh, follow up where Mr. Rapallo began, that would you agree that all of the impacts you cited uh, that might flow from a delay um, at the demonstration evaluation phase um, are, would, can potentially be more serious, more costly, and lengthier if they're incurred in the next or subsequent phases of the program? That they, that it, as, as was described, we may disagree on the one ten hundred dollars but there, there is an almost inevitable escalating effect to delaying problems in this process? That would certainly be a, the conceivable output uh, outcome. However, I think our, our, our view at this point is that the delay to, to, to arbitrarily decide today to delay, to really do in essence, and I, and I don't want to get into nitpicking, but to, in essence what we're talking about here when you get to level seven is the early phases of EMD. That's what we would do in engineering. We, 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 we focus on the manufacturing part and the production part of it. We don't focus on the E, which is the engineering. And that's a critical next step <clears throat> in bringing these technologies together. We believe, and we could be proven wrong next year and the decision would not thus be made, but we believe the technologies will be at that proven level that enable you now to move into that engineering of EMD phase. So given that, the delay to us would be costly, unnecessarily costly, and, and, and would be just unnecessary on, uh, on, on the face of it. But in a hypothetical world, having nothing to do with JSF, certainly if you have uh, tremendous technology issues and you go into EMD and lock yourself in, you could be asking for an escalated problem. I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I just don't think that applies to the JSF. Thank you. Let me um, say, and then I'd, I'd like David to come back with answering a, a question related to what you were saying up here. I, I've, I've heard uh, you both say, you know, this is something we, you know, we've never done before. You're very proud of the program, the fact that you're moving towards the best commercial practices. But what I feel like as I hear you is that it's, it's going to be um, so significant to DOD that you've moved in this area that if you do it halfway or three quarters way, this is monumental. And I might, I might agree with that, that it would be monumental, but I have to hear an argument that says you can't go all the way with the program. And so for you to say you're doing three quarters of it, um, and you haven't used those numbers, but that's the feeling I get, um, wouldn't, wouldn't satisfy me unless you say, I, we can't do best commercial practices here, here, and here because, and then let us evaluate it. So I'm going to have stay on the table that really there's no argument against using best commercial practices to the, to the nth degree unless. And, and I just, you know, kind of want to say that to you. How, how would you define, I mean, I, I, and if we gave that impression, I think both, both of us would regret it. I mean, how do you define uh, doing it all the way versus the three quarters? I mean, where do you feel well, that we've indicated we're not? Well, when you start to talk about it as a tool and not a requirement, um, and, and maybe in the private sector it's a tool and not a requirement, and then that's fair. Uh, yes? I, I would just say that uh, I'd emphasize that we used a different tool. And again, the reason we did it because we wanted something that would allow us to manage risk, not just assess it. Right. And, and our intent is not to go three quarters of the way. We intend to reduce every critical technology that we identified to a low level of risk before we go into EMD. Very important point. And, and the requirement that, that is there 
is the technical match technology maturation requirement. That is a requirement. That is not a, a, a negotiable. What is, what is negotiable is the TRL becomes like the yardstick, so it's versus using a yardstick or a ruler or another method of measuring what the outcome is going to be. But the key here, the outcome we all seek, is technology maturation, and that is not a negotiable. Is the DOD 500 rewrite, uh, 5,000 rewrite, following this practice, uh, best commercial practices? Yes. Because when you say it, you say, in your statement on page 10, finally, let me be clear, the strategy I have articulated for the revised acquisition process that will be prescribed in the DOD 5000 rewrite and which is largely being implemented on the JSF represents a real departure from our traditional approach to system development. That's the basis for my making that comment. I buy into the fact that it represents a real departure from our traditional approach, but it's still the word largely you know, so you just, you just, just so you have a sense of why I get the feeling I get. I just had one follow-up on Mr. Halloran's questions about the TRL levels. You said, I'm, I'm just trying to understand, the information that was provided to GAO was from the contractors, their evaluation, or from the program office? I, I'm, you know, I, I wasn't involved in that process, but I know the program office was involved again. with the contractors. I didn't hear the work. question. I'd like to have you ask a question. It, it was just a question of where the information came from for the TRL, uh, TRL levels, right. okay. the contractor or the joint program office, or probably some combination, combination. of both. It, so it, is that what is the answer? I believe it is, Mr. Chairman. I, I wasn't involved in the exact process. I know the program office was involved, but I think the contractors actually did the work uh, w either with the program office or with the oversight of the program office. And your position was the GAO asked for information based on TRL levels, asking also including the risk of integration. Yes. And that information was provided. Yes. So, and, and that would be incorrect, you're saying. They, they Basically, were, I'm trying to figure out if yeah. these numbers are too low because of that. Yes. But that's, and, that, and, that, and that's the crux issue that, that here is that if you measure individual technologies relative to the risk of being able to integrate or to integration, you come up with one answer. If you measure them as individual technologies relative to their technology maturity, you come up with a second. And that's what the rescoring was. So in our view, the rescoring actually does raise the numbers. To, so not to level seven, but they certainly raise it. Are these the numbers that represent the rescoring or the initial? These numbers are the initial. So the, the rescoring numbers would be higher than this? Yes. OK. I'd ask you a question over the next what would they be? Uh, well, <laughs> the question is, what are they, I guess? I think all of them would be at five okay, and six, so and at this I'd point, like to, I'd like you to tell us what would they be at. <clears throat> I don't know if I have the specifics on each of them. Let me see. Let me, let, why don't we take that for the record and give you a? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, our, these are our estimated ratings um, based on not having to integrate. Right. These are the, with the what was referred to as the rescored numbers. Six, six, seven, seven. Without the risk of integration, that's the point. point right. right. They were not scored to. to um, we have. And I'll just take them in order. Seven, six, six, seven, six, seven, six, seven. Okay. And, and, I, can, and I have the rationale if you just, I mean, I'm not going to tell you what the technologies are, but in order of these numbers here again, uh, as, and I think General Hewitt referred to this a moment ago, one flying on the concept demonstrator aircraft, which is, we believe, consistent. Uh, technologies already flown in aircraft, helicopters, or spacecraft. Um, Another one, such systems are similar, are, are being used in similar commercial environments, including the, triple, the Boeing 777, Federal Express, Caterpillar, et cetera. Another one flying on the F-16. Another one, technology flown on a JSF flying test bed. Another one the same, flying test bed. Uh, another one uh, flown on the JSF flying test bed, and another one flying on the CDA as well as the F-22, the F-A-18, and the Eurofighter. So in each of these cases, if you look at are we using the technology in a relevant environment, per se, the, they are all being demonstrated where they, in, in that means. Now, um, that is the rescored numbers. So, but that's based on your assessment, correct? Not my, this, is, this is a DOD assessment. Right. Yes. And, and so in Technology 7, you, you, you have a leap of two levels just by not having to integrate. In technology one, you leaped up one. Technology two, you went, you went up two. Technology three, you went up two. In te technology uh, well, four, technology you went seven, up two. Yes. Let me just say, yep. technology um, six, you went up two. Technology seven, you went up two. That's a, that's a big jump. 
again, because you're trying to mature the technology without considering the risk of integration on the JSF platform. Okay. So we can, we can basically accept GAO's assessment uh, that they got if we have a footnote and says it's not integration. Uh, based on, excuse me, based on that, in, and we could accept your numbers based, uh, excuse me, other way around. They're saying it's not integrated, therefore that's the score. And you're saying if you don't consider, I want to say it right here. I, I, I think I understand where you're going. And my answer, I, I, for my own you know, sense of uh, self esteem, I need to say this again. <laughs> The bottom line is GAO gave you a lower score because uh, of a we failure scored. to integrate. We and you're saying no. integration shouldn't have been a factor in your score. And your score is higher without integration. No. You're, you're asking if we can accept this as under that other definition, if you will. And I, would, I think I'd have to say I'm not, I don't believe we can because there are other issues associated with it. We did that. You want a little conference here? On no, I, 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 we might want to take it for the record, but I think that you have to, the, the table itself is confusing, and I'm not sure that we would precisely accept every level that was there. I, I welcome sometimes a little bit of qualification by two people in the same panel, and if that's all right, Mr. General, do you, do you want to just say what your sense is? Yeah, I think, once again, you go back to where these things came from. They were provided to the GAO, but those scores were based on considering the risk of integration on the JSF. Right. When those scores were rescored again and provided to the GAO, they were without the integration of JSF, the integration on the JSF, that's when they go up the, the right. appropriate level. So, but I just want to know if you accept their score when there's, uh, by, and, and look at the score that you have provided us, would they accept your score in your judgment? I mean, in your talks with each other, did was this really the big debate, whether it was integration or not? And you could pretty much as agree on your numbers. Okay. Um, the answer is uh, uh, hard to figure out what they were saying when they did this. But <laughs> well, well, let us take that for the record, sir. We'll okay. come back to a fuller, fuller Fair answer. Enough. You all have been very responsive. And um, is there a question you would have liked me to ask that you prepared all night for that you want to say? <laughs> I'm just going to say that my staff gave me so much to read. I stayed up all night. The, their statements have been very interesting in the third panel as well. So, And your presentation has been very, very helpful and I think candid. Yeah. Uh, I'd just add one, one point. Sure. It's not a question. And that is, to go back to what we said earlier, uh, the debate here is not over whether or not we do need to demonstrate and are com whether or not we're committed to demonstrating technology maturity before we move into EMD. And that is a very important step and a, and a critical discipline that we are instituting in our process with the JSF and in future programs. And um, I, I believe it's very important as we do that to recognize what it takes to and, and, and to recognize the E engineering part of EMD, which is the next step. So I would just reiterate that point again. You know, I'm just, I, I don't know if I'll be chairman next March, or, but uh, it will be very interesting. Uh, one of the things we do is we put every statement on the record and then we have to live with it. Um, I'm just, the problem is uh, in, when it comes to this kind of program, the same people aren't always the same people who have to answer for the decisions that were made two years ago. I mean, on the congressional side as well as your side. Uh, sir, and, and I just point out that I won't be here next March. So that, that's a guarantee. But uh, <laughs> okay. we have, uh, I think you saw the news this morning where both the, uh, the House and Senate uh, Armed Services Committees have included language requiring us to be able to demonstrate to the Congress that we have achieved technology maturity before we move into EMD. And, and, and we can live with that and, are, and are, have no problem with coming back to demonstrate that or, or, or document that for the Congress next year. And that means low-level risk. Yes, sir. Yeah. Exactly. General, any comment you'd like to make? No, I think that covered it. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, we'll, we'll end on that note. Very, very nice to have you both here, and thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank for you, your Mr. Presentations. Chairman. We'll get to our third panel, and I appreciate the patience of our third panel. Our three panels, and you uh, would remain standing so I can swear you in. Dr. Thomas McNower, Deputy Director, Aurora Arroyo Center, Rand. Mr. Rodney Larkins, Business Development Manager, 3M Corporation. Dr. Wesley Harris, Department of Aeronautics and Astronomics, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, 
the three of you would uh, we'll make sure we get you there. If you'd raise. Hello, Harris. Raise your right hand, please. Thank you. Do you, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yeah, thank you. Note for the record that all three have responded in the affirmative. And um, we'll just go down the row. Uh, doctor, we'll start with you first. And um, actually, we have two doctors here. I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Manauer. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It, it is a pleasure indeed and an honor to be here. Uh, let me, at, at the risk of... I'm going to ask you to speak a little louder or <coughs> move yeah, the mic a little closer. Can, can okay. you pull yeah. it a little closer? Great. Somewhere Thanks. between last night and this morning, I've acquired a, a cold, so I'm about an octave lower. <coughs> Excuse me. I have me. absolutely no sympathy for you, yeah. so... <laughs> uh, <laughs> let, me, let, uh, let me start by, uh, by saying I don't know uh, much about the JSF program per se. Uh, I was asked to speak here because I, I think I know a great deal about the weapons acquisition process, at least as it functioned during the Cold War. I wrote a book about that. It came out in 1989 from the Brookings Institution. And in that book called New Weapons, Old Politics, I examined what might be called some of the perverse patterns of, of Cold War weapons acquisition, uh, one of which was the tendency to rush weapons through development and, and into production. And in particular, I focused less on the move from uh, the, what's called the demonstration validation phase and more on, the, on the, uh, the move out of the what is now called EMD and into production, uh, so-called production concurrency. So it's not exactly the same issue that you're dealing with today, although I think you'll find a lot of what I have to say about the incentive structure and the way we measure risk Just suspend to be for relevant. One second. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Uh, <clears throat> production concurrency or, or the, the, the tendency to substantially overlap the latter stages of development with the early stages of a move to, to high rate production was a fairly common practice during the Cold War and it was justified on two grounds. Technically, uh, it was justified on what might be called the theory of declining uncertainty in development. That is, we assume there's a great deal of uncertainty back in the DEM-VAL phase, but in a somewhat linear fashion, we, we reduce those uncertainties until by the end or nearing the end of EMD, we, we should be able to move into production. Uh, on the other hand, on strategic grounds, uh, we were confronting a numerically superior enemy, and, and so we, we justified a rush as a way of getting a jump on the Soviet Union, getting ahead. The the faster you could get these new technologies out, uh, the, the, the farther ahead you were of the Soviet Union, everything being equal. Now, when I started my book, I more or less agreed with those premises. Uh, when I finally started writing, I had come to disagree, especially with the first one, the theory of declining uncertainty. I would substitute what I call the J-curve theory of, of program uncertainty. That is, sure, at the beginning of, of a development project, you have enormous risks, and you do, through DEMVAL and the early part of EMD, neck those down to reasonable levels, but I encountered in almost all programs a rather sharp upturn in risks as the program actually went into production. Uh, three reasons for that. One was systems integration, and I, 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 I like the fact that you're talking about systems integration this early in the program. During the Cold War, systems integration often occurred very late in a development program, sometimes after production systems were already out uh, in the field. And, and what you find looking back at the history is that even simple components stuck together in a new way, produce new problems that you didn't know were there, and that forces a design interaction. Uh, the second problem that drove risks up was the move to production tooling itself. Again, even with simple systems, somehow the move to a production model from a pre-production prototype introduced risks, some of them great, some of them small, but almost always a subtle interaction between the producing engineers and the developing uh, engineers. And, and finally, when you finally got this, this thing out into the field where rear soldiers and sailors and pilots could, could, uh, could use it, they invariably uh, discovered new ways to use it that it wasn't designed to do and it started to break and then you'd have to go back and, and redesign it and fix those. This is in a sense a tribute to the ingenuity of developers and, and also users in the military, but it could be pretty embarrassing sometimes the kind of breakage uh, you could get. So all three of those uh, 
than would appear very late uh, in the process. To the extent that production concurrency ignored those risks, and, and to use the, the jargon of today's hearings, to the extent that, in a sense, it, it wasn't knowledge-based, it, it didn't take account of these later rising risks, we discovered a fairly expensive way of developing weapons during the Cold War. I mean, if you'd geared up for production, you'd capitalized, hired the labor, every delay, every change cost a lot of money. If you already had systems in the field, you were faced with this vexing question, do we retrofit the fixes to the field of systems, which was always expensive, or do we just let those go? I would argue we had sort of what I would call the ABC approach to development, the A model of a lot of airplanes. And, and other things, too, often had serious design anomalies in it. The B model got it roughly right, and the C model is where you really wanted to be all along. But it took maybe even, you know, 100 or 200 production models uh, to get there. So it, it was expensive, and, and, and when you did that, the average effectiveness of your overall force actually was lower than it would have been had you waited and gotten all the production run, or most of it, uh, to the sea level. Now, we accepted those costs ostensibly in a, in a uh, desire to, uh, to uh, confront the Soviet Union. Uh, and you would think that uh, now with the Cold War over, as, as you say, uh, Congressman Shays, we could relax uh, and we could do this, this better. And, and let me say that the way you do it better is not having a sharp divide between development and production. I mean, the point of my research was that the early stages of production are part of the development process. Again, to turn to the, the jargon today, knowledge points two and three tend to to, fuss to get, fudge together and, and you, you don't want to have a sharp gap. You, rather, you had to treat the early stages of production as with respect to late arising uncertainties, perhaps starting very low uh, uh, with a low rate of production, getting systems out into the field, flying or shooting or driving the dickens out of them for a while and taking all of that information back and imparting it to your design before you really went to high rate production. Uh, one of my colleagues at RAND years ago uh, remodeled some of of the uh, Air Force aircraft programs of the 60s, 70s, and 80s on that basis and, and concluded that you could probably get a more effective fleet overall for a little less money if you did it that way. Now, you, have to, you added a little bit to the development cycle, which everybody thought was too long, but uh, with the Cold War over, that shouldn't be much of a concern. So we might be in a position to move now to a more relaxed approach. Uh, I'm skeptical of, of our ability to do this, however, because uh, I think that production concurrency was as much a political as a, as a military strategy. That is, it was rooted in the, in the politics that we see here today, in the politics of the acquisition process. Uh, surely in the development of a new system, the move late into late development and early production has to be the most vulnerable stage. You now have prototypes of the system. You fly them, drive them. The data almost always is going to contradict the optimism of early assessments. Sometimes you get tragic accidents, a helicopter crashes or a plane crashes. Sometimes you get funny accidents. You know, the, the gun that's supposed to shoot a helicopter shoots the fan on a nearby latrine, as was the case with the, the DIVAD. If this were purely a technical environment, everybody would have a good laugh and they'd go back and they'd redesign that system and fix it. But in, in the, the very charged political environment that can come to surround expensive programs, you know, it's, it's hard to desensitize that, that, that evidence. Knowledge and information become uh, very dangerous. And delay, I, I'm thinking of your earlier discussion, you cannot convince convince a program manager that a six-month delay isn't the beginning of a mortal wound. How do you handle that? Well, you, you in a sense, you stack the deck. You raise the costs of, of slowing down, and you, you may even have production versions out there uh, before you actually get that uh, information. Uh, what I'm describing, in a sense, is the, is the dilemmas of weapons acquisition in this country as a political as well as a technical process. From a technical point of view, you really want to have a great deal of flexibility late in the process. Uh, from a political point of view, flexibility can be downright dangerous, and so we tend to structure a certain amount of inflexibility uh, in there. This is not a dilemma we've ever resolved in our history very well. If you step back from the Cold War and look at the 200 years of, in which this nation has bought uh, weapons, you would argue that the problem wasn't slowing the acquisition process down. It was getting it to produce anything at all. 
right? I mean, we, we would test endlessly and then not buy. Our technology generally lagged uh, the Europeans. Uh, and, and as a rule, we, we had trouble getting things through the juggernaut of the political process. That ended with World War II and, and with the Cold War. So while uh, talking about political strategies may sound like I'm being critical, you know, we ought to, to understand that for 50 years we produced uh, and systematically modernized the best force posture in the world. Okay, so it's not clear to me <coughs> that we can slow this thing down. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Uh, and, and this is why I refuse to pass judgment on the patterns of acquisition I studied uh, in, this, in, the, in the Cold War. We are now in a unique period in the nation's history. We are not confronting a great Soviet threat, as you've said, although the world remains dangerous. Moreover, we remain engaged, and there are threats out there. So we're, we're sort of at the Goldilocks situation, you know. It's not you know, no threat, not a big threat, but sort of right in between. And the question is, can we come to the Goldilocks solution for weapons acquisition? That is a, a, a process that, that is, is uh, relaxed enough to take account of late arising uncertainties, but not a process that goes to sleep and doesn't uh, produce anything. Uh, and that returns me really to the first paragraph of your statement, Mr. Chairman, which talks about uh, uh, the emergence of a consensus about how we're going to handle this. This hearing focuses on the JSF specifically, but the JSF, as you recognize, is the beginning of a wave of new modernizations and, and recapitalizations after a 10-year procurement holiday. So this hearing is also part of the way in which we construct this, this consensus, and, and it remains to be seen how that will work out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, your book was uh, the reason why you're here, and your testimony justifies your presence. Thank you. Mr. Larkins. Good morning, or I guess I should say good afternoon. Good afternoon, and you've been wonderful to be so patient. Uh, but I learn as much from the third panel and sometimes more, so uh, uh, from my standpoint, I'm very happy if you were here. Thank you. <clears throat> as, business as business development manager for government research programs at 3M, I'm here to, dis to discuss 3M's best practices associated with our new product commercialization process and the timely integration of breakthrough technology into the change of the basis of competition products. 3M is a diversified manufacturing company with sales of more than $15.5 billion. We manufacture a broad range of products directed at six distinct commercial markets. 3M has grown by pioneering innovative technologies and creating new products with these technologies, thereby <coughs> creating new markets and revolutionizing existing ones. 3M is a written policy objective which states that 30% of all product sales for a given year come from products that were introduced in the four preceding years. 34% of 3M's total sales in 1999 came from products in this category. It is these new products which help sustain the profitable growth of our corporation to maintain this rapid pace of technology development and new product introduction, 3M has evolved a well-defined technology development and commercialization process. A basic tenet to successfully introducing new products is the discipline to make the upfront investment in research and development. 3M has invested more than a billion dollars per year over the past three years in research and development. This investment is directed both at broadening and strengthening 3M's existing technology portfolio, as well as moving products rapidly through the commercialization process. Currently, approximately 20% of 3M's research and development <coughs> budget is directed at technology development and enhancement. Approximately 80% is directed at product scale-up and commercialization. This investment ensures the availability of crit critical technologies to turn into products and the product development resources to focus on the corporation's priority programs. In our quest to maintain technical and market leadership in the markets we serve, we have evolved to a laboratory structure which substantially segregates technology development from product development. Our experience has been that key technologies are, are used broadly across the corporation's market groups. By focusing on technology development in a technology center, a critical mass of technology experts is created costly redundancy is eliminated. 3M has formally established 14 technology centers for the corporation's most pervasive technologies. The responsibility of these centers is to establish and maintain world-class capabilities in these critical technologies. A second responsibility is to work with product development teams and the business units to integrate this technology into the product development programs to assure successful and timely product introduction. This step is critical 
and a number of management tools have been established to ensure that it takes place. 3M is acutely aware that even our best technologies when not applied to timely commercial product development are of no value and we work hard to maximize that application. Critical to the commercial success of our company is our ability to select and to focus on programs with the best possibility for changing the basis of competition and large, and large market opportunities. Despite 3M's large investment in research and development, our resources are finite and there are always more opportunities than there are resources. Important steps in program initiation are opportunity identification, development of a comprehensive product or system description, a business assessment of projected results once success has been realized, and a technology assessment which indicates that technologies are in place to meet performance requirements. All of these ele elements must be in place before a program is approved for scale-up and commercialization. At the initiation of the product development process, a formal review is held to assure that all elements are in place for success. Hence, success on these key programs is critical to the success of the corporation, and our goal is to put these programs in the very best possible uh, position to succeed. Once underway, the development team follows a detailed new product introduction plan, which outlines all elements <clears throat> which must be accomplished during the product development process. Periodic program reviews are routinely conducted with the emphasis placed on encouraging and rewarding candor on the part of the product development teams and identifying and eliminating impediments to the success of the team. In addition, corporate review teams are employed. These review teams bring together experts in product development from across the corporation to identify pr potential roadblocks to successful commercialization and to identify resources to eliminate those roadblocks. In summary, 3M's approach to technology integration and product development has proven to be very successful. This, this process, however, is far from being perfect. It is a process that we will continue to evolve, and our goal, of course, is 100% success on all of our priority programs in the corporation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Larkin. Mr. Larkin, you, um, you work for, a, I think, a pretty amazing company. When I think of your company, I think of it as Though it's very large, it has tremendous innovation, um, as a small company might have. And uh, it's uh, great to have you here. And Thank I'd you. love to know how the, we can see comparables between what you do and, <coughs> and what we need to do in government in general. Thank you. And specifically with defense. Dr. Harris, just want you to know, sir, I'm always awed when I see a doctor and I see MIT next to it, so. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I very much appreciate the opportunity to address this uh, distinguished subcommittee on certain issues. I'm going to ask issues. you to move the mic a little closer to you. Um, and if you can turn it a little over the paper as long as it doesn't get in the way. Does it get in the way? From no, I'm fine. Okay, that's perfect. This is fine. Sure, thank you. Again, I very much appreciate the opportunity to address this uh, distinguished subcommittee on certain issues related to technology maturity and acquisition reform. I wish to state at the outset that I approach this important topic from the perspective of both an academic researcher and as a former government manager, not as an engineer practicing within the defense industry. It is my view that our defense acquisition policy and practices are complex. This complexity is a result of several factors, including a dynamic or shifting defense industrial base, a declining acquisition budget, a constantly evolving threat environment, a diverse force structure, and most importantly, an increasingly rate of change of technology. The impact of the last factor, namely the increasing rate of change of technology on technology maturity, from an acquisition policy perspective, is difficult to overstate. The impact is made more profound when the global nature of, such, of much of this technology is considered in the acquisition uh, of new weapon systems. I'd like to add to this list the following elements that have an impact on, on the acquisition of defensive systems. The current focus on greater life cycle value, the emphasis on more rapid deployment, the emphasis on upgradability, sustainment, and maintenance. Mr. Chairman, while noting that today this subcommittee is addressing a specific program and within the defense <coughs> acquisition arena, I wish to state for the record that the impact of acquisition reform reaches beyond the procurement of defense systems and its related technology. Through our defense industry base, 
Acquisition reform drives our national economy and impacts world peace. In short, our success in developing an effective and efficient acquisition strategy that captures mature technology exposes the risk to control our future, to produce wealth, and to continue to contribute to the advancement of humanity. Based on my research and government experiences, I wish to share with this subcommittee today several national successes. First, there exists several case studies of successful acquisition of defense systems in production. Second, there exists case studies of successful parallel development of advanced technology to high maturity levels where the government is customer. These two successes have in common and I believe have many things in common and I believe are related to today's issues of acquisition reform uh, in the environment of uh, technology maturity. My success or my research on economically incentivized contracts focus on several important programs, including the Sensit Fuse Weapon System, the Joint Direct Attack Munitions Program, the C-17 Program, C-130J, the F-414 engine development that goes within the F-18EF airplane, and the F-117 engine that goes in the C-17 airplane, as well as the uh, uh, Boeing 757 airplane. These programs were in production we were able to develop an economically incentivized contract or a win-win solution for both government and contractor. A few comments now on the development of a critical complex technology in advance, full, in advance of full system acquisition. In the early 1990s, 1990s, NASA's Office of Aeronautics did develop and manage two technology development programs. These were the High Speed Research Program and the Advanced Subsonic Technology Program. During the same time period, NASA also worked jointly with industry and DOD to develop advanced gas turbine components within the integrated high-performance turbine engine technology program. These three programs of technology development were successful, and as stated in the prepared statement, over 12 reasons why they were successful. Mr. Chairman, the subcommittee may wish to note the very strong commonality between the factors leading to successful development of technology parallel to full system acquisition and the factors that enable a win-win solution for programs already in production. At the most fundamental level, the environment for favorable development of advanced technology is very similar to the environment for acquisition of defense systems in production where technology risk is low, corresponding to technology at a high maturity level. These assessor programs, uh, both advanced technology development programs and acquisition of full systems, defense systems, strongly suggest that advanced technology at a high maturity level is essential to the acquisition of affordable systems with requirements for superior, superior performance. The importance of advanced technology at a high maturity level is so great, in my opinion, that the government must incentivize the contractor to develop advanced technology. This means that the government must place a premium on the development of technology to a high maturity level. The premium must compare favorably with other awards available to the contractor. The economic realities of a high premium will at least should drive the government to a lean portfolio management condition. Advanced technologies selected for development to a high maturity level must be or should be based on realistic projections of need. Mr. Chairman, before concluding, um, I would like to add a few additional comments. <coughs> I wish to note that in and improved, uh, to improve the chances of successfully developing advanced technology to a high level of maturity, one, or we, those involved, should adopt a common quantitative-based uh, language and assessment tools. Qualitative descriptions of, of technology readiness, such as the technology readiness levels, are insufficient and inconsistent with realistic projections of need. The desired quantitative-based language and assessment tools 
are recommended to be derived from probability in each technology readiness level, the TRL, would be expressed or defined by probability bands. In conclusion, we as a nation have demonstrated the capability to produce weapon systems driven by advanced technology. My colleagues have clearly confirmed that. To become more efficient at the acquisition process, we must continue to develop advanced technology in parallel to acquisition of full, complete systems. Key elements, again, in this efficiency are to incentivize industry with favorable premiums, a realistic projection of advanced technology needs, and the use of quantitative-based language and assessment tools. The bottom line is that government and industry know enough about each other and about advanced technology development to make affordable acquisition of full systems and technology insertion work and to make it work efficiently. The health and wealth of our nation depends upon this working very efficiently. I would entertain questions if there are any. Thank you. There will be questions, and um, I'll just throw it out to all of you. Um, <coughs> you just First off, you are all here for the entire hearing, and I thank you for that, because the value is that you can comment without me having to repeat the questions. Uh, conceptually, uh, a best practice model for acquisition makes sense. Uh, in the private sector, uh, for private development, also makes sense for the private sector for a public customer. Uh, would you all agree with that? And if not, if you'd qualify it where you would, I mean, conceptually? So I, I, I make the assumption nobody would disagree you're, with that. You're saying that the best commercial best practice is, right. is transferable to the public yeah. process of, of and, buying And that. that we should seek to, to, to use <clears throat> commercial best practices. The, the, the only caveat I would raise, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I mean, Obviously, no commercial firm operates in the kind of political environment. Just a little on. louder for you. I'm, I, I know you're not feeling well, and I said I wasn't sympathetic, but yeah. I just Despite didn't want. Your lack of sympathy, I didn't want to give you sympathy because I didn't want it to get worse. Uh, so. uh, there's a lot of differences, obviously, between uh, buying weapons as a public good and and buying a prior or developing a private sector uh, item. The only the only difference that that though leads me to question the use, uh, the extensive use of best practice models is, I don't think in the commercial world very often you systematically take these huge leaps out into the unknown as we as we did during the cold war and i think still still do that is not not only the components of a system but the integration of the system uh... really represents a, a dramatic jump beyond but you don't have any fear that we're doing extensive use of this now i mean we're not <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean <laughs> And this is the, uh, I'm not aware that um, a, a commercial best practices model is uh, running rampant throughout government. No, what, what I'm saying is trying to apply it to the government, to this process, has right. the, the limit of, of this. Most commercial firms, if insofar as they're doing marginal improvements, are, are aware of risks and costs <clears throat> at a fairly good level of certainty. You know, most of the discussions of risks in, in the early phases of Cold War development programs proved in the long run to have been wrong. I mean, you don't know what the numbers really are. You have an idea of a cost performance curve. But they were and, always always they were, they were, and they were almost always understated. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that, that's not a, an indictment of anybody's behavior. Technology okay. just doesn't give up its secrets that easily. And so we have these very precise discussions during DEMVAL. Uh, and, and the curves are going to shift. That's, again, why you need more flexibility down the road. And I, and I think commercial practice may not have to, to, to deal with that kind of uncertainty. Uh, okay, we'll come. We'll touch on that a little bit more in a second, Mr. Larkin. When I think of 3M, I would think that you use a knowledge-based process, a, a best practices model for acquisition, as defined by GAO when they talked about knowledge point one, match is made between the customer's requirements and the available technology. Yes, sir. Uh, knowledge two, uh, when the product design is determined to be capable of meeting performance requirements, and three. Uh, knowledge point three, when the product is determined to be producible with cost, schedule, and quality targets. I would think 3M would just be right in the center of that kind of philosophy. Yes, sir, that's correct. Where it might differ is that I think of 3M 
uh, with no disrespect, uh, but just in terms of putting it in perspective, that um, you are, are seeing customer needs and then you're seeing how you can meet those needs with products that, that you have potentially available and technology that you have available. I make an assumption in most cases the technology is pretty developed or sometimes do you have to, do you see a need and you just start out from scratch with a technology? That, that happens, sir, and, and it also uh, where, where we will in fact start from scratch and develop okay. a technology. We, uh, a, a lot of it depends on, on how broad your window of opportunity is in the market. What we have, are finding today is that, is that if you don't meet a market need quickly, then the market need is met by someone else. And so what we try to do is do a, a, a rapid technology assessment, determine whether in fact we have technologies in-house to meet that need. If we don't, then we will go out and, and make a technology partnership or acquire a technology. And, and admittedly, you're the, so time is of the essence. Absolutely. But your technology requirements may not, and certainly wouldn't be as complex as developing an aircraft for... That's, yeah. that's very fair to say. So we need to have some empathy for the task at hand, that, that applying best commercial practices um, is a very important effort, but certainly we can carry the commercial to the defense and and uh, we may be it may be unfair to say that you need that the DoD needs to do it just like we do it in the private sector oh I yes I do think that's that it would be unfair to to say that 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 their technology integration problems uh, are are as easy as ours, because they certainly are not. And uh, but I, I would like to agree with uh, with um, my colleague, Dr. Harris. I I, th I think one of the one of the reasons we are successful and are able to to achieve the type of, of uh, record in, in product integration scale up that we do is because we do have a significant investment in technology. We have a broad base of technology platforms that we can tap into and they're ready to be integrated. But you, it would be unlikely for 3M to go into development and, pro, uh, and production without the technology there to back it up. We absolutely would not. You, w you would <clears throat> not. We right. would not. So the general principle that there's tr significant logic in developing the technology before you went into development and production still holds for the defense as well. Uh, 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 well, all I can say is that we do not go into a product scale up mode until we have the technologies in hand. So then if, if you can't meet the deadline, you just don't produce the product. That's correct. Yeah. Um, Dr. Harris, would you want to comment on the questions I've asked so far? Yes, I would like to, to comment, sir. The use of the words uh, commercial best practices and, and our consideration of the, this environment of acquisition in the, of defense systems uh, that phrase is a very loaded one. It has many meanings and uh, usually differs depending upon the speaker. Is that, is that just, if I could interrupt, is that because there is no one so-called commercial best practices? The different companies have their version of, of best practices? Well, uh, that's somewhat it, sir. But I think it's based, prim my statement is based primarily on the fact that there's no commonly agreed upon body of knowledge as to what it really is. Uh, it's a, it's a, a sort of catch-all phrase that has uh, caught many up into some more political stance than, than real substance. For example, the question of scaling along technology complexity, the question of scaling in terms of number of products, uh, the questions of availability of markets, uh, are, all would impact commercial practices. And you don't have a serious discussion of commercial best practices being transferable along what is, in fact, scalable. So we're, I'm somewhat personally concerned as to whether what we really mean when we say that DOD or the government ought to rush immediately into commercial practices. Um, it just does not have the substance that I, that I think it must have in order to hold those who practice within government accountable when we say that they ought to use or should be using best practices. So you would be more sympathetic to the view that um, that when we use um, TRL technical readiness levels, that it be more a tool rather than a requirement? When you heard them refer to yes, it I, I heard, Yes, I did hear that discussion, sir. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think we are wrapping ourselves around an axle with the qualitative uh, discussions of technology readiness levels. 
until we can move to a, a point, a position where we can quantify what we mean by technology readiness, we can't hold those who practice, who ac acquired the weapon systems accountable because they and their contractors uh, will always be at each other's throat as to what they mean when they present an argument or a position on technology readiness levels. So I'm calling for a more quantitative right. language and assessment tools to enable all of us to understand precisely where we are within uh, this, this arena called technology readiness levels. Um, that's, that's Spoken like a true academician. <laughs> <laughs> You're fulfilling your role perfectly. <laughs> well, one of the things is that I'm not burdened by being a lawyer. And I don't have any perceived, uh, and the reason why I love, love this committee and, and love the work as a legislator, I'm not trying to prove a point. I'm trying to understand what uh, we as a committee need to recommend to the full Congress and to the, to, to the executive branch. Um, but intuitively, um, I have accepted as a fact, and Mr. Uh, Dr. Um, McNair, I, I don't, um, I'm going to try to have you separate a little bit the so-called politics side of this, and, and then we'll get back into that. Um, but I accept as just very logical, uh, without a lot of empirical knowledge, but just your own life experiences, that, that if you are uh, um, going to be de developing technology and development, uh, and, and fail to come to grips with some technology, and then you've got a point where the technology hasn't been resolved, and yet you're still moving things along, that your costs are going to go up significantly. You're going to begin to slow down your development after you start it, particularly in production. And, and I accept the, the point that you made, Dr. Manauer, that, that, um, uh, that sometimes we haven't perfected the product until we've produced 100 planes, and that there's a real negative. So, Dr. Harris, tell me why intuitively I shouldn't accept the fact that we should develop the technology before we go into development, but particularly into production. Okay. Well, I, I can't tell you that. I, okay. I, I want my testimony to read very clearly. Right. That we I can't as put a nation... words in your mouth? <laughs> yeah, right. We, we as a nation ha has, have, in my opinion, um, been successful in developing technology in advance of acquisition of the full system. Okay. Okay. My experiences at NASA with the high-speed civil, civil transport, the new 700,000-pound Mark 2.5 airplane, we developed that technology with industry as partners. Um, the airplane was never built because of the business decision, but not because the technology was not there or was designed to be there in advance of building the airplane. So we know how to build or how to develop technology in advance of acquisition but, of Right, but the systems. question is, is it going to be cost effective? Uh, the, oh, I would say it, it definitely is cost effective, and the effectiveness goes up, I believe, with the complexity of the final product. Um, if, uh, if you're talking about very complicated systems that require uh, a real stretch in technology, then clearly the effectiveness is going to be there. Okay, I'll invite, Cost effectiveness. I'll invite the other two to jump in a second, but what, where you're missing, where I'm not with you is, um, I, I, I would think that waiting to develop the technology before you did the development, but particularly production, uh, uh, would be um, to your advantage. As long as you don't have the time restraint of having to get into the marketplace because someone else is going to build the product. Well, I agree, and as I know the threat, at least the military threat that this nation currently faces, we have that time. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Any other responses to any points that uh, that you want, either of you, Mr. Larkin or Dr. Menauer, any comments you want to make? Um, when you heard the debate between. Um, uh, the dialogue between the first panel and the second panel. I want each of you to tell me your reaction, not in, you know, as concisely as you can. And tell me how you reacted to the two different testimonies. Because I think both testimonies were quite excellent. I mean, I think GAO gave us a wonderful vehicle in which to have this debate and, and dialogue. 
but I, I'd love to know how you reacted as you heard it. No criticism of the committee allowed, just the, <laughs> the other side. Well, I, my, I'll go first. Yeah. Feel free. <laughs> <laughs> I'll happily defer. <laughs> And I, I, I thought the first panel was, uh, was again, a very excellent presentation. Uh, I think there was an honest mistake in, in interpreting um, what technology readiness levels were meant. Uh, was it to be on a full-up system or a comparable uh, system? And that led to, uh, I think, a, a downgrading of the so-called technology readiness levels. What I thought was missing in the first presentation was a, a, a normalization of the two possible streams to the same system. One stream is what we currently have, at least what the first panel proposes that we have, namely that we buy this complex weapon system uh, and develop the technology while we buy it. Uh, another stream would be to develop the critical technology off stream, and then insert it when we are ready to move forward with the full system. Now, uh, my question is this, what is the cost going along the first stream, and what is the total cost going along the second stream, and what are the timelines involved? When does the clock start? How would we know that if we, d if we don't know if we can actually develop the technology? Well, I, I, as far as I know, sir, no one has ever really done a comparative analysis, analysis of that sort, unless uh, Dr. McLaughlin has done it. Yet we get these, this constant bombardment of how to develop systems and how to develop technologies that support systems offline. But the answer, uh, Mr. Chairman, is no one really knows. Okay. Now, uh, when, I, when I heard, and then I'll open it to the other two of you, when, when I found myself wondering if um, moving forward with development represents a, uh, with, where you still have high risk on technology, whether that represents a, a significant negative. But I clearly uh, f feel that, that if you went into production without the technology, then, then we are really opening up potential costs, I mean, that ratio. So I found myself more tolerant of DOD kind of wanting to go to that development stage. Uh, I would become very concerned if they wanted to go that one step further. In other words, I think there's still is high. I think there's still high risk in some of their technology. I would, um, yeah. Okay. I, I I don't know the specific technologies involved with this okay. weapon system, as I am not a consultant to any of the, the primes. But the two different ways of getting to the same end goal, a highly complex system, is what I think we don't have a comparative analysis. Fair on. Enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Dr. McNoffer, or yeah. Uh, first of all, I don't know enough about the TRL methodology to, to comment on it expi explicitly. I, I think it's, it's absolutely appropriate to, to be hammering on the, the readiness of these technologies. The, the disagreement between the two, two prior panels, uh, and not everybody agreed that there was a disagreement, but seemed to, 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 to circle around the question of whether you're assessing risk in the context of systems integration or the risk of specific technologies. I can at least understand why you'd get a different number in each of right. those cases, given what I said earlier. And, and so the one upshot I would have, and I think I'm, I'm echoing something uh, Dr. Harris said, uh, is that you know, when you, whenever you move, the, or this project moves from DEMVAL to EMD, don't think think that just because you reach TRL7 for components, you're out of the woods. There's a lot of development work and there's going to be a lot of sometimes nasty surprises up ahead. So, and yeah. I don't think GAO was suggesting that. No. Agreed. You're right. So, okay. so I can understand why there might be a different measure depending upon whether you're thinking of the specific technology or that technology in the context of an overall system because the system does pose its own uncertainties. Mr. Larkins? Well, <clears throat> There, there seem to me to be two two basic uh, issues that, that came up. I think there was a... Move the mic just a little closer. I'm sorry. There, there seem to be two basic issues of, of, of disagreement. I think there was an awful lot of agreement, but there were two basic issues that I caught that were... that were There was disagreement. One was that one was the the TRL as a... Uh, the d definitions used in each, in each individual uh, category. And... <clears throat> Again, I have to agree with Dr. Ter Dr. Harris here. I think that that if you're going to use categories to to uh, uh, 
to use to evaluate a project, you should have general agreement by everybody, the people who are being evaluated and the evaluators as to what those categories are and, and where they fit. And there obviously wasn't any there. The, the, other, the other disagreement was that, that, that there is a substantial um, difference between a fully integrated system with eight apparent uh, critical technologies versus evaluating each of the individual critical technologies. And, and frankly, um, at, at, at 3M, when, when we look at integrating several new technologies into a, into a program, if, if, if we consider, for example, that, that each technology has a 90% 90, 90 chance of success, then, then, then you have to do a, a, a multiple of those chances of success to arrive at a, at a, at a final ch chance of success for your program. So if each of your programs have a 2% chance of failure and you have four, or each of your technologies has a 2% chance of failure and, and there are four technologies, you're, you're looking at a 16% chance of failure right <coughs> there. And, and so I, I'm completely sympathetic with, with what the Department of Defense is, is saying here. Um, and yet, and yet um, you would be sympathetic with the fact that integration sometimes may mean that, that the technology doesn't work. That, that's, that's correct, <laughs> and, and, and that's why we frankly take a very conservative uh, view of, of, of that approach. We, we, um, uh, and believe me, we do take risks, but there are they're calculated risks, and, and the greater the risk on a, on a commercialization program, the tighter we monitor it. Let me ask you, do you have any questions? Uh, Actually, just one. Yeah, sure. Um, Mr. Mr. Larkin, Chase, uh, would like to ask a question. Mr. Larkins, mm -hmm. um, what kind of incentives do you provide uh, your, your um, teams, your project teams, um, to ensure that a new, new product that you're trying to develop comes in on, on time and uh, within, within budget? Well, th there are, uh, in my view anyway, three three different types of incentives, uh, peer recognition and, and reward, and, and we, have, we have programs in place which recognize individuals and teams for uh, outstanding success in, in, in product introduction. Uh, of course, uh, uh, promotion, and, and when, a, when a person is a program manager and they're, and they're involved in a successful product introduction, there are certainly uh, promotions that are involved in, the, in that, that type of an activity. And, and finally, uh, uh, financial incentives as well, which go along with the promotion and, and, uh, and, and separate from that. So, so recognition and reward and promotion. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask that question. Happy you did, because uh, I just wonder if, if um, in the, pro in the the federal government, when they uh, are uh, utilizing the services of a private company, whether those companies themselves have their own internal programs um, to encourage as much innovation and extra effort and so on. Let me say this to you. I, I've really asked the questions I want to ask. Uh, I'm going to allow all of you to make some closing comments or, or ask yourself a question you wish I had asked that, that you think I should have asked. Um, I'd also like to just ask uh, if um, uh, Mr. Rodriguez wouldn't mind just coming to the corner here and just kind of sharing your observations. Is anyone from DOD that would, was here that would, uh, would like to, or if, if they hear a comment, they, do we have a representative from DOD who would be... Uh, they, they, but we had, we had let them know they would be invited if they were able to stay, and I realize they, they couldn't necessarily stay. But why don't we turn, if you can just sit on the corner here, if you could do that. Um, is, is there any comments that you would like to make or observations? And if so, I'd move the mic over to you. This is not, the purpose of this is not a debate, but just to, just to say things that you would want us to focus in on or... So on. I, I guess I'd like to uh, say a couple of things to try to add a little clarification. Uh, sure. The, the work that we did on the Joint Strike Fighter and the application of the TRLs, uh, being able to do that was the culmination of years of work. Right. It was not easy to define a model, uh, uh, to go out and find. I'm not saying that the model that I put up earlier that reflected what we defined as, at this point, best commercial practices that can be applied in DOD, that was gleaned from a lot of work, working with a lot of companies and working with the department, looking at successes and failures mm -hmm. and trying to categorize what people do to come up with the knowledge points that are critical to being able to move forward successfully. When we put that over the Department of Defense for comment, the report that, that led to that, 
and one of the things identified there, obviously, knowledge point right. one, separating technology. The original comments that we were getting back were very, very negative because it would require a significant change in the way they do things. Dr. Gansler at the time was coming on board. He took that on and rewrote the comments, and I can tell you I never get comments like this. At the end, he writes a personal note on the formal comments coming over, a very thoughtful and helpful report, Jack. Believe me, I never get these. What we then did is we said, okay, if you agree with, if you could put that chart up, please. You know, you know it's if interesting. You if you just agree a with that. A little nice comment like that goes a long way, doesn't it? We all need to do it to all of us. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Hey, yeah, that's the only one I've ever gotten. <laughs> the, uh, so if you look at this chart then, we said, okay, if everybody can agree with this, and we had, a, we had to come up with a model, run it back by the, all the commercial companies yeah. we did, because they didn't know how to define what they did. They don't think about it in this term. Nobody had a model for us to use. We had to work and find it. Find it, define it, get it understood by both parties, DOD and the commercial guys, and let's agree to some things. Once we got agreement on that, we went back and we said, okay, if this is true, let's peel the onion. If, if technology development separating technology development from product development is so critical, how do you do it? Okay, I, I, I need to know what your bottom line the is. The bottom like. line is we did a whole study to come up with the technology readiness levels. Right. We didn't get there by accident. We did right. a whole thing focusing on knowledge point one. But let me, and we worked with a lot of individual technologies, both commercial and defense. What we found was that they work, that they can predict outcome, that if you meet the right technology level, you can get success. If you don't, you are virtually guaranteed failure. You're a brave guy to say that right next to Dr. Harris. Okay. Yeah, I know. Okay. I'm not, I'm not he, guaranteeing there are better ways to I do understand. it and refine uh, it. I'm just saying they, they are a great <laughs> indicator. Now, where I was going with this was, or trying to just get to, just don't want you to get too was deep in In that here. report, yeah. before we applied it to a program, see, we applied it in the abstract and didn't criticize anything. We never said anything. We said, here they are. Here's a tool. Isn't it okay. wonderful? You know, can't you guys use this? Doesn't it make sense? When we defined it in there, and this went to the Department for Comment, and I'll read you their comments, we said, we defined the TRL-7, when the components, and because we were talking about where does integration fit, and I think that he was they were confusing the issue. There are two types of integration. There is subsystem integration and there is product integration. Okay. Now, we got a whole bunch of technologies that are at subsystems. Integrating proven technologies into a product is a real challenge and it's something that has to be done. Matching technology to requirement up front doesn't stop that from happening. You still have to do it as a challenge. What we're trying to do is isolate that because that's what you should be doing in product development. Isolate that from the technology development, which is proving the technologies in the subsystem forms in which they have to be in. So you're not trying to do that concurrently, right. especially on pacing items. So we said, when the components, this is in the TRL, re, the technology readiness level report that went on the part, when the components are assembled inside a case that resembles the final radio design and are demonstrated aboard a surrogate of the intended aircraft. Now, when they comment on this report, they say, the department agrees, this is, a, this is their writing, it's not mine, we reprinted in the report. The department, the department agrees that TRLs are an important input and are necessary, but it adds that they are not sufficient alone to decide when and where to insert new technologies in the weapon system programs. Military system development decisions require a total, a total ownership cost approach through the entire life cycle of a system. And I, you know what, I totally agree with that. We weren't trying to imply that once you reach seven, you have to put it on a product. We were saying, if you don't reach seven, you got problems, and you shouldn't put it on a product. They went on to say in their comments... Okay, I want you to bring this to a close The department here. concurs right. with the GAO. This is their comment. The department concurs with GAO that the weapon system program manager should assure that technology is matured to TRL-7. I just read how we defined it in the report, and they agreed before insertion into a new system. They agreed with that here. The difference in the JSF study was we then crosswalked that and said, hey, you know what? When you apply this on the program you're doing, you're not there and you shouldn't move ahead. And it wasn't until we made that crosswalk in a draft report for comment that all of a sudden this issue of, up oh, it was a misunderstanding. That's where that came up. It came up once they saw how it was used. Right. And if they had read this report in detail, which I had provided to them before we started, they would have seen how it would be used. Well, let me just say, I think they did read the report. Uh, the, 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 the advantage that GAO or members of Congress have is we can look at something that someone else is building and doing, and we can sit with hindsight and all the other things and, and really um, 
uh, be pretty analytical about it. I think your report was done very tastefully. I think it, it served a tremendous uh, a use here and will be used by other committees because, as you know, your report was used by the Armed Services Committee even before we released it today. And I think DOD was uh, fairly respectful of, of your analysis. Uh, I think there are uh, I, I, I have a sense of where our disagreements are, and uh, um, a lot of good is going to come from the report. And uh, uh, but I'm excited that this is a program being used by defense. I want to make sure that they're using it to the full extent possible. Um, and uh, let me just—I'll uh, let you say another comment here. But let me just ask Dr. Harris or Mr. Larkins or Mr. Manauer, do you have any comments you want to make? Any question you want to ask yourself and then answer? Brilliantly. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, no question, but I would like to conclude by simply repeating myself. Sure. We as a nation have demonstrated the capability to produce weapon systems driven by advanced technology. To become more efficient at the acquisition process, we must continue to develop advanced technology in parallel to acquisition of full, complete systems. Key elements in this efficiency are, number one, incentivize industry with favorable premiums to develop this advanced technology. Two, realistic projections of advanced technology needs, meaning a management of our DOD technology advancement portfolio. Third, use of quantitative based language and assessment tools. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Three, three points. Uh, the first taking off from Dr. Harris's last remark, uh, and it's a different, it's a subject of a different hearing, but one that should be kept in mind. We have never found how to make R&D per se profitable in the defense industry. The historic tendency is firms sink their own money into development and get well in production. And that, you know, if you want to relax this process and maybe even cancel the occasional system, you probably want to have uh, a way, a mechanism for making R&D profitable. We've never found that. And that's the way you encourage industry. And, and it's, a, it's a profound problem in the defense industrial base, precisely in this area we're moving into. Okay. Second point has to do with the earlier discussion of the tenure of program managers. I, I, I must say I'm fascinated with the idea of a program manager who who actually has to live with the results of his or her decisions, you know, five or six years later, I think it would be a profound change. Uh, again, though, stepping back and looking at the, the full sweep of American history, remember that before World War II, the Army had an ordnance department, which was a bunch of full-time program managers and, and technocrats, if you will. They, they wore uniforms, but they didn't rotate. And, they, uh, and, and I think the Army's conclusion as an institution coming out of World War II was that the ordnance department was not attentive enough to the user, the actual operator, uh, and, and more fixated on the technologies than on military capability. And, and what the Army did in the 50s and the 60s was begin to substitute line users as not only program managers, but also as the, the, the chief of R&D, for example. Wasn't uh, there also another danger that they developed too cozy a relationship with the, the, the organization they were buying from? The uh, well, uh, after over time, you just began to just become almost their advocate, not necessarily their... You know, my sense of the Ordnance Department, to the extent that I understand the historical relationship, it, it had a, a somewhat thorny relationship with, with commercial firms because it was doing its own R&D and it was always being besieged by okay. members of Congress okay. pushing Samuel Colt's uh, pistol or rifle or, or some, you yeah. know, so it, it was a more combative relationship. Sorry, I didn't realize they did the R&D. I just thought they yeah. were... Okay. No, Springfield Arsenal, the Arsenals did R&D, so they were competing with okay. industry just okay. to some extent. But the point is that a, 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 ten, a, a program manager tenured for 15 years years or 10 years may, may become very attentive to sort of the permanent features in the environment of which the political structure is one and, and not as attentive to the, the military users. So, so maybe there's a, a length of tenure that sort of balances those needs. It's, I don't think it's three years either. I think it's longer than that. And finally, uh, at the risk of complicating things, I would just separate technologies into two bundles, slow moving and fast moving technologies. Okay, If you look at an airplane, an engine airframe combination had its fast moving days back in World War War one in the 50s, and uh, that's slow-moving technology. You, you can afford to stop, assess that technology, test it. You know, if you look at the electronics in the avionics suite on the other I'm going to just interrupt yeah. you a second just so we can uh, ask a question of the recorder. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, if we look at the avionics in the in the uh, the, the 
the cockpit of that airplane, which, which may come to 40 or 45 percent of the cost of the airplane. Uh, we're looking at technologies where if, if you stop and test and decide, you know, they're already obsolete. I mean, they're turning over in a year, 18 months, two years. And, and I've always felt that we really need, uh, now that electronics technologies are really seen to be the, the key to the revolution in military affairs, we really need to to handle these by different commercial practices. One can be much slower and more judicious because you're way out on the flat of the cost performance curve. You're pushing for that marginal improvement in jet engines or airframes. The other is just so fast moving that, that you, you almost have to be turning your design and your, your, your test uh, over uh, constantly. It's got to have a different approach entirely. Hey, thank you. Mr. Larkin, I knew that would bring you out. If, if, if I could just make uh, one additional... Would you move the mic, please, towards me? If, if I could make just one additional comment, um, I, would, um, I would say that, that our experience in industry with the importance of, of uh, focusing on fewer, larger programs, that, that uh, having trained people who are who we call program managers or program development managers whose, whose expertise is scaling up new programs, uh, we're beginning to see within industry a focus on that as a discipline. Uh, 3M uh, traditionally has what we call a dual ladder system where we have <coughs> technology people on one side of, of, of the, of the, um, of the promotion scale and, uh, and management people on the, on the other side of the promotional scale. So you have research and, and management moving up together the same opportunities for advancement, the same opportunities for pay, this kind of thing. But we are now uh, uh, in industry beginning to see a third leg of, or a third ladder in, in this process, which is a focus on program management. Terrific. Any other comment? Yes. Yeah, I would like to make one because this becomes a real area of concern, and it is related to this. Because I started, I've started looking at some data really hard, looking at this whole issue, particularly as it applies in tech here. This issue of profitability for research and development. In private industry, research and development is an investment. The return is on sales. You don't make money in R&D. You make money building product and selling it to somebody. The same principle should apply in the Department of Defense. It should apply in the defense industry. The reward for doing the right thing is you sell us something that you make a profit on. When I looked at this issue, again, trying to study this, what I find is when I look at tactical aircraft, from 1973 to 1991, we built anywhere annually from 350 to 500 aircraft. In 19, from 1991 to today, we're building hands full, 40, 50 aircraft, it, sometimes much, much less than that. And then we have an industry saying, we're not profitable. Wall Street's beating us up. We can't, there are a lot of other factors. But one of them is, they don't, we're not producing a lot. We got into a cycle where we're heavily into R&D, and so now the issue becomes, how do we make R&D profitable? No, the issue becomes, we have a modernization strategy, and I think this is a real issue that we need to take a hard look at, that drives us to cycles that makes the industry unprofitable at times. Is the solution to pay them for R&D, pay profit rates, increase profit rates on something that is normally an investment account, or is the solution to better plan our modernization so that you equalize production so people can make money? and we can modernize. I think it's a very fine point. I saw Dr. Harris start to waver a little bit here, and, and I, I am at overload. So whatever you guys are, I'm at overload, and I see a new, new recorder, and we're, we're done. Julie Thomas, thank you for nice all your work. Uh, there's no question you were working hard today. And um, I enjoyed this hearing. I learned a lot. I think our witnesses in all three panels were terrific. And I also uh, appreciate the staff from both the majority and minority for all their good work. So everyone have a beautiful day. This hearing is over. Okay, I think I'd stop.
just ahead, Energy Secretary Bill Richardson on OPEC and oil prices. Then a